I'm in Tionaca, Bolivia, where the Incas say mankind was created. Not far from here are the mysterious ruins of Pumapunku, which feature magnificent megalithic blocks. Today, most archaeologists believe that Pumapunku was part of an ancient temple complex, but they are baffled by the uniformly shaped and sharp-edged stone blocks found all over the site. They're also puzzled by an even bigger mystery. What type of structure did these blocks actually form? Could it be that the ruins of Pumapunku offer evidence of advanced, extraterrestrial technology being used in the ancient past? For an ancient astronaut theorist, there are few sites on Earth more intriguing than this one. And that's why I'm here investigating the incredible mystery of Pumapunku. My name is Giorgio Tsoukalos. I explore the world that exists between reality and speculation, the known and the unknown. What we've been taught by mainstream scholars is not the whole picture. But I'm convinced that every day we are one step closer to the truth. High in the Andes Mountains in the Altiplano Desert is Tiwanaku, one of the most rugged and desolate places on Earth. This region of Bolivia has seen its fair share of warfare, invasion, and turmoil over the years. But I'm here to see if it also experienced contact with extraterrestrials. In 1549, while searching for the capital of the Inca Empire, Pedro Cieza de Leon and his Spanish conquistadors discovered the ruins of what looked like a massive temple complex at what is now called Tiwanaku. Mainstream archaeologists suggest that these ruins were once the center of the Tiwanaku civilization with approximately 40,000 inhabitants. But little is known about the people who lived here or the structures they left behind. Of special interest are the walls of this large square-shaped courtyard, which features numerous carved stone faces that suggest those of extraterrestrial visitors. But located just a half a mile away from the Temple of Tionaku lie the ruins of what is thought to be yet another temple complex the mysterious site known as Puma Punku, the gateway of the Puma. The name was given by the local Aymara people who found artifacts at the site depicting imagery of warriors wearing masks made of Puma skulls. But the Aymara have only inhabited the area for around 800 years, and Puma Punku is believed to have been built thousands of years ago. But what was it? A temple? A meeting place? Some elaborate monument? All of these possibilities have been suggested, but to this day, no one knows just what this place was, who built it, or exactly how old it really is. But what's even more intriguing is that the blocks here don't even look like those found at Tiwanaku. It is one of the places where logic no longer makes sense because the blocks that we have here are unique on this entire planet. This is the only place. So check it out. Here are the awesome, awesome H blocks. They're made from solid blocks of precisely shaped andesite. Whenever I see them, and, and this is just the, this, this feeling that you get at Puma Punku, I'm at a loss for words because this here is something that can't be found anywhere else in the world. Mainstream archaeologists believe that these H blocks were created by hand with primitive stone and metal tools. Tools, I should mention, that they have never found examples of. But what's so very interesting is that they seem as if they are part of a larger picture. 
that if you put them together, they form a solid wall, which is very incredible. If another block was placed on top or this was placed on, on top of another rock, these are features that make these two blocks fit together seamlessly. Because the one thing that we have to remind ourselves with this particular construction style, no mortar, no binding agent was ever used. These pieces are so perfect that they fit together interlockingly in such a way that you don't need anything with which to bind together the two or three or hundreds of pieces. Other examples of this type of precise interlocking stonework can be found in Cusco, at Sacsayhuaman, and even Machu Picchu. But nothing with the sophistication of this place right here. I mean, it's incredibly enigmatic. Everywhere I turn, I see more and more incredible blocks that can't be explained by mainstream scientists. This is pretty amazing. I mean, check this out. If you look at this groove right here, I mean, forget chicken bones. You simply cannot do this with primitive tools. And you've got these holes drilled at an equidistant, as if it's some type of a female piece to a male piece. So what was it that actually fit into this? Because one thing to me is crystal clear that this here, or any of these pieces, they have nothing to do with any type of embellishments. I mean, this here, these look like technical components, part of a larger, almost industrial construction. I've got a little paper clip, ordinary paper clip that I've just unfurled to see how deep they go. And they actually go equidistant all the way down. I mean, that is something that cannot be achieved with, with chicken bones. As far as I'm concerned, these stone blocks had to have been cut with some type of advanced technology. But what? Back in 2012, I met up with machinist and toolmaker Chris Dunn at his workshop in Danville, Illinois, to put a Puma Punku stone sample through the ultimate test. We've got a sample of the laser cut. This is the diamond wheel cut. And the top surface is the original cut surface from Puma Punku. So now we can compare the difference between all three cuts. Looking at an actual piece of precision cut stone from Puma Punku under a microscope, Chris compared the two modern cutting techniques with the part of the stone cut thousands of years ago. Even taking into account centuries of time and weather, Chris's comparison revealed incredible differences. You've got vitrification on the laser cut side, and then of course you've got circular tool marks on uh, the, the side cut with the diamond saw, and then whatever tool they used to cut the ancient surface must have been a different method. Now, do you think it's possible that some type of a diamond precision tool was used on the old surface, but because it was such a long time ago that over time, the surface became a bit more rough, and we're talking 10 or even 15,000 years ago? That is a reasonable speculation. I think we have to start examining um, a little more sophisticated tools that no longer exist. The cuts from the diamond saw were the best comparison to those found on the stone blocks at Puma Punku. So we're talking about the sharpest, most sophisticated cutting tool we have today. So how could a so-called primitive society have achieved such sophisticated stone carving techniques. Check out this block right here. There's something really cool about this one. First, I wanted to show you true north on my compass, which, as you can see, this is true north. Now watch what happens. All of a sudden, true north is over there. 
it's in the complete opposite direction. And here, even more so down there. This is wild. So what is going on here? Clearly, this rock has been somehow magnetized. So was it exposed to some electromagnetic waves? Or is it like this because at some point, these blocks underwent or came in contact with something strange? I mean, this whole place is bizarre. Below the plateau where the H blocks are located are the steps and walls marking the edges of the Puma Punku Mound. Now I can truly see the scale of the site. If you look down all the way, you can see it's perfectly level. It's perfectly level. This is a newly excavated area that I haven't seen before. And again, it shows tremendous precision. Check out this, for example, right here. What's really interesting is that you can't even put a piece of paper in between the fittings, and no mortar was used. So, I mean, this is really incredible stuff, and this is very, very, very old. But at the same time, it is just utter perfection. Located at Tiwanaku, just a half a mile from the H blocks at Pumapunku, is a giant stone structure called the Gate of the Sun. Here, you can find depictions of the god Viracocha and his winged children. Look at those incredible carvings. It's one giant piece, a monolith made of andesite. It's incredibly difficult to carve this with any type of tool because it has to be harder than the current andesite. In the 1960s, at this same location, a wall was excavated to reveal a fascinating array of stone heads. But who do these strange heads represent? There is one structure here that may provide a clue. This is a place where the Bennett monolith was discovered, and it's a representation of Pachamama, 21 feet tall, the largest monolith ever uncovered here. Pachamama essentially means the cosmic mother, because Pacha means cosmos, and Mama, well, I don't have to explain that. And so the idea is that this is a place of creation. And I find that interesting because if you look at the different heads that are built into the wall, some look uh, very different than others. So the question arises, are these heads representing different races of humans? Or are they depictions of the so-called gods, alien visitors who came down from the sky? It's fascinating to look around and see these ancient monuments at Tiunaku and Pumapunku. But I still wonder just how old these ruins really are. Before I began my investigation, I made a trip to Switzerland to talk with my good friend and mentor, Eric von Daniken, who gave me some great insights into the history behind these incredible and mysterious sites. Eric. Tell me about Puma Punku, because what I find interesting is, according to some translations, somebody suggested there is a calendar there. And this calendar goes back some 20,000 or so years. Now, this calendar, George, you're referring to, is clearly proven. There are scientific books written by Dr. Edmund Kiss, that's 50, 60 years ago, uh, by Dr. Professor Bellamy. I knew him personally brilliant explorers, and they absolutely deciphered this calendar of Tiawanaku. And it dates back at least 24,000 years in the past. But our modern archaeology does not accept these dates because it contradicts our evolution. 
In 1928, German explorer Edmund Kiss drew elaborately detailed recreations of what he believed once stood at both Tiunaku and Pumapunku. He became one of the first to suggest that the ancient structures were far older than the traditionally accepted date of 200 AD. Another German researcher, Professor Hans Schindler Bellamy, dated Pumapunku to before 10,000 BC and theorized that it was destroyed by a flood. The Spanish conquerors, when they arrived, they were up there with their soldiers and they took the Inca, the ruler of them, and they showed them these ruins of Pumapunku. And they asked them, how did you make this? Because we, from Spain, we were not able to move such gigantic blocks. And then the Inca ruler said, it was not us who made it, it was the guards who made it in one simple night. Mainstream archaeologists who dismiss the local stories of gods constructing Pumapunku have long argued that ancient people could have moved these megalithic stones through sheer manpower alone. During an experiment conducted in 1966, members of the Bolivian army attempted to drag a two-ton megalithic block and raise it using only rope they barely managed to shift it by a few inches. But assuming that the ancient people here really were able to somehow raise these giant blocks using nothing more than rope and manpower, how did they get them here in the first place? Mainstream archaeologists say the massive stones were hewn at quarries over 60 miles away, and then they were rolled to Pumapunku on logs. But there is one major problem with this theory. We're at an altitude of over 12,000 feet, which means there are no trees, because trees only grow to a certain altitude. And if somebody proposes that this whole place was deforested and they just cut down the trees in order to move around these blocks, then they don't know what they're talking about. So the idea of wooden rollers falls by the wayside. While I'm in Bolivia, I want to find out what the local people know and believe about both Pumapunku and Tiunaku. Right next to the ruins is the town of Tiunaku, home to the native Aymara people. The Aymara have inhabited Bolivia, as well as Peru and Chile, for at least 800 years, descending from other cultures in the area that go back as far as 5,000 years. They continue to speak the native language of their ancestors and have kept alive the oral traditions of their people for centuries. With the help of my translator and guide, Juan Carlos, I've arranged to meet René Quispe, an Aymara elder and local historian. So what can he tell me about the legends, how, for example, Tionaku was built? <laughs> He said that also is created with a cocha. With a cocha, for us, is invisible God who takes care of us every day. The sun god Viracocha is the Andean creator and destroyer of worlds. According to ancient legends, Viracocha was born on the Isle of the Sun on nearby Lake Titicaca. Eventually, Viracocha disappeared over the water as if it were land without sinking, never to return. He was sitting near to the Lake Titicaca. How do you say? Washer, like that? Yes. Washer, washer, like that, no? I'm shocked to hear this Aymara elder mention the term watchers because the watchers are a key component of the ancient astronaut theory. So to hear this term associated with the ancient stories of Bolivia is pretty awesome. According to the Book of Enoch, an ancient Hebrew text found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
The Watchers were a group of 200 angels sent to Earth to watch over the early humans. But when they mated with human women and created a race of giant hybrids known as the Nephilim, they angered God and were banished from returning to heaven. Now what's really interesting is that the Inca also tell of Viracocha creating a race of giants. So hearing an Aymara elder and historian say that Viracocha was also considered a watcher is incredibly fascinating. Was there a particular reason why it was built? Yeah, also for, he said that, it's mysterious, say that, no? But he said that we are sure that one day there were giants. There was a darkness time, yeah? That the giants jump out from the lake. Giants jumped giants. out of the lake. He said that the giants uh, hold big stones and then the oh, they were shaving off the polishing. Look at that. The question I would like to ask is if we look at the gate of the sun with Viracocha in the center and all those winged beings, what is the significance of it? Children of the sun with wings, no? Pakahakas, the eagle men. They were how do you say, like court of Viracocha in one time? They were Viracocha's court. He said that in big ceremonies, or people, they use a special mask. Yeah. Their faces would never be seen by the rest of population. Also, you can see monoliths, no? With a mask. According to the Anales de Cuauhtitlan, a document from 1570, Viracocha said, if my subjects were ever to see me, they would run away. Now, when I hear that, I'm tempted to ask, did Viracocha need a mask because he didn't look anything like his subjects? Could he have been a real flesh and blood extraterrestrial? How does he react when people say, for example, that this place here could have been built more than 10,000 years ago. Yeah. He said that it's right with you because he's say he thinking about 15,000 years ago. I agree okay. that this place existed before the flood. Okay, he said that post Nazki, it's really is the beginner, no? It's really interesting to hear this Aymara elder mention Poznanski when talking about the date of Tionaku. Arthur Poznanski spent over 40 years in Bolivia researching and writing about pre-Inca archaeological sites. Poznanski proposed that Tionaku was around 17,000 years old, and he developed his theory after examining the connections between the ancient temple complex and sophisticated astronomical alignments. According to his theory, the structure at Tionaku called Kala Sasaya was built so that the sun would rise directly over the cornerstones on the summer and winter solstices. And based on the changing tilt of the earth, you'd have to go back at least 17,000 years for that to happen. Today, many people say that Poznanski's theories are miscalculations yeah. and that it was just fantasy. He say that uh... There are archaeologists from different countries or from interior of Bolivia come here, but they come with different mentality of the city. Bosnaski, he excavated. He worked too much in this archaeological site. Look at that. Right. But another archaeologist, really, they don't know our, about their traditions, about beliefs, no? They trash too much to the technology, say that. What a great honor to meet Aymara elder René Crespi and to ask him about the Aymara traditions. The three things that stuck out were, one, the giants. 
And it's amazing stuff that they came out of Lake Titicaca and that they used stones with which to whittle down the giant blocks. And then the second one was the stories about the Watchers. And that is interesting to me because the stories of the Watchers exist worldwide. And then the third one was that he completely agrees with the theories of Arthur Poznanski. After coming here and seeing this place firsthand once again, I'm more and more convinced that Poznanski was correct and that the local stories about Tionaku being built by some kind of extraterrestrial beings might be more than just mythology. Much, much more. I'm in Peru meeting with author and ancient astronaut theorist David Childress, a prolific author on the topic of ancient technology. He has spent most of his life traveling the world and challenging established assumptions about mankind's history. He's just the person I need to help me sift through the evidence and connect all the dots. I really do think that uh, Puma Punku is one of the few places in the world where common sense no longer applies. Something really weird happened at some point at Puma Punku. I mean, when was the last time you were there? I was there uh, just uh, about six months ago or so. David has studied Puma Punku for decades and he believes that it is the key to showing the connection between ancient civilizations and ancient space travelers. One of the things that I enjoy you talking about is that when we look at these stones that obviously have been cut in a very precise fashion, that in your opinion, it had to have been done in an easy fashion, with easy means. What do you mean by that? One of the things is when you see the, the articulation of the stones at, at Pumapunku, and, and the H blocks are such a good example, the stone masons were getting very fancy, and they're doing things that are way beyond what they need to do. But it would seem as if with the, the power tools that, that I think they must have had, there was nothing they couldn't do. They could be as fancy as they wanted because it was easy for them, exactly like this. It's unnecessary elaboration and decoration. You're thinking, oh, this, this must be so much labor and moving the stones and cutting the stones. Yet it, it had to be easy for them. And moving the stones too must have been easy for them. It's not something that's so incredibly difficult as, as we would imagine that, that primitive architects and engineers would be doing. It has been suggested that some sort of anti-gravity technology may have been used at Puma Punku to lift and place the massive stone blocks. But if that were true, it would certainly suggest that some sort of highly advanced technology was in play here. You have also the areas with keystone cuts, and the, the, the poured clamps of molten metal that, that went into those cuts. Yeah, just like these. Yeah, right. And that's such an unusual way of, of fitting stones. And that is something that you see at the Sun Temple, Cori Concha, in Cusco. You'll find also these keystone cuts. And at Ollante Tambo on the way to Machu Picchu. Right here. That's Oyante Tambo right there. Right, right. That's an indication that the same builders of Pumapunku and Tiwanaku are also the builders of the Sun Temple in Cusco and at Oyante Tambo and Sacsayhuaman, uh, even Machu Picchu. But then you can go around the world and find this unusual keystone cuts in Egypt, in Greece. This is at the Giza Temple. Okay, there at, at Giza and the Sphinx Temple. You're also going to find these at Borobudur in Java, at Angkor Wat in Cambodia, and at the megalithic site of Mai Son in Vietnam. 
These mysterious keystone cuts exist at a surprising number of ancient sites all over the world. It's a building technique that involves pouring metal into cut rock on both sides of a joint. And it has been suggested that the clamps that went inside them were made of copper, bronze, silver, or a mixture of silver and gold. Curiously, in nearly every case where keystone cuts have been found, the clamps have been removed. Or possibly the structures are so old that the metal has eroded completely. But some still contain remnants of metal, which leaves no doubt that the architects had at least rudimentary knowledge of metallurgy. You know, stuff like that is sensational because it would imply one of two things. Either, as you say, they were the same builders or that they were the same teachers because clearly it is not a similar construction style, it's identical. It's, it's not something that could really have been developed independently. And, and so the mainstream archeologists are, are basically just ignoring this because if, if they were to discuss this, it, it would completely wreck their whole theories that these people are, are isolated from each other. I mean, they had to be made by the same kind of engineers and, and architects. I'm in Peru with fellow ancient astronaut theorist, David Childress. We've been discussing the precision cut stone blocks found all over Pumapunku. Many of the blocks contain keystone cuts, which are also found at other megalithic sites. But these aren't the only striking similarities that exist between Pumapunku and other ancient sites found throughout the world. There's so many similarities, in including the monolithic doors that you have at Pumapunku and, and Tiwanaka, where these, these doors are just cut out of one solid piece of granite. And you find that too uh, at Persepolis in, in Iran, for instance. And then on top of all that, you've got the Fuente Magna Bowl that's now in the Precious Metals Museum in La Paz. Thought to be over 5,000 years old, the Fuente Magna Bowl was discovered near Lake Titicaca by a local farmer in the 1950s. It features hundreds of triangular carvings that are strangely similar to the cuneiform text used by the ancient Sumerians. But what is a bowl featuring Sumerian text doing more than 8,000 miles from Sumeria, or as we know it today, Iraq? Could it be further evidence that what ancient astronaut theorists have been saying for decades might be true? Could early humans at one time really have been influenced by visitors from another planet? That bowl has two forms of Sumerian writing on it, Sumerian hieroglyphs and Sumerian cuneiform. It's been authenticated by Bolivian archeologists and all that mainstream archeologists can do at this point is ignore it. It's not something they could ever address because it would completely blow all of their theories out of the water. What makes a Bolivian archeologist less mainstream than all the other mainstream archeologists? In my opinion, nothing. So why aren't they confirmed by the rest of Archaeologist. It would change history. The Fuente Magna Bowl is uh, basically proof that the Sumerian Anunnaki coming to South America. I believe that Tiwanaku and Pumapunku uh, were, were mining centers. The idea of Sumerian writings being discovered near Lake Titicaca would relate to the theories of author Zechariah Sitchin and his proposal that the Sumerians were interacting with a highly advanced extraterrestrial race known as the Anunnaki. History has to be rewritten. Uh, eventually, they'll have to address 
these things. I look forward to uh, whatever results you come up with. I'll definitely keep you posted on uh, my, my findings. After speaking with David Childress, I'm more convinced than ever that Puma Punku was constructed with the assistance of extraterrestrials. But my questions of what these blocks actually formed and how the structure was destroyed still remain unanswered. To get a better picture of just what this incredible site might have looked like when it was first built, I returned home to meet with Casey Hematyar, a forensic structural engineer based in Los Angeles. With more than 30 years of experience investigating all types of structures and building materials, I knew that Casey would be the perfect person to analyze what Puma Punku was built to be and what violent forces might have led to its destruction. Mr. Hamachiar? Yes. Hello. How are I'm you? Giorgio. Great pleasure to meet you. So, in your opinion, how do you think something like this was cut? The first thing is that um, how these people uh, several thousand years ago had this ability and this precision and the knowledge to create such a structure. Is it impossible to use a copper tool in order to create these? Um, probably yes, because you need a material that has a much higher hardness in order to achieve this goal. In modern days, we do these type of uh, structures. We call them tilt-up. Let's say this wall is three-story, okay? So what we do, we come right next to that particular site. We place wood forms all around it. Once we place the reinforcing, then we pour concrete into this and we flatten the surface and we let it stay there to cure for several days. Then we have a special cranes that come and then we lift them, we bring them. Now, we're doing this at the same time on four sides. So what you're telling me is the way it works is that the whole thing is raised by a crane like this. Yes. So in reference to Puma Punku with all of this, I mean, here we have blocks that some have estimated to be around 100 metric tons, and we're also at an altitude of almost 13,000 feet, so the air is rarefied. You know, it's uh, kind of a dicey place up there if you're not in physical shape. So how would you move a 100-ton block without a, a crane? Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Even to an expert like Casey Hematyar, the methods used to carve the stones at Puma Punku and then lift them into place remain a mystery. But now I'm even more eager to find out not only how Puma Punku was built, but why. I'm in Southern California in the offices of forensic structural engineer Casey Hematyar. Using CGI technology, Casey has spent the last three weeks constructing a three-dimensional model of Puma Punku. And now he's about to show me not only what he believes it might have looked like, but how it was ultimately destroyed. Here we've got some visualization of what uh, potential combination of putting these together to create the platform. Man, I'm blown away by what Casey is showing me. A three-dimensional model of what Puma Punku might have looked like more than 10,000 years ago. It's unlike any other model I've ever seen. It even has a large platform area that I can imagine being used as some kind of a launching pad. Was Puma Punku some type of spaceport for ancient astronauts? Or the headquarters for a team of alien engineers and scientists sent to explore the Earth? Oh, this is cool looking. Really awesome. But now I'm more puzzled than ever. How could such a large and magnificent structure have been so completely destroyed? As a forensic structural engineer, do you think 
that an explosion might have been a reason for the destruction of Puma Punku. The size of these uh, stones, the weight of them, the mass, and the way I look at the pictures, the, the remains of these, it's my opinion that it, it would be very remote that that would have been the cause. Okay, so then what does that leave us with? The concept of flood uh, would make more sense to me. Casey's computer animation of Puma Punku is consistent with various theories which suggest that the enormous stone blocks were somehow lifted up and then dropped down. It's also consistent with what I've been hearing from everyone I've spoken with so far, that Puma Punku was built sometime before the Great Flood. The soil becomes almost liquid, getting saturated by water. It loses its stability, and therefore, it's not capable of providing support to the structure above anymore. And with the movement of water itself, that can cause movement of those objects. The idea that Puma Punku was destroyed by a flood makes perfect sense because seashells and fossils of fish have been found here even though the nearest body of water is more than 10 miles away. The cataclysm or the flood is strong enough to jumble up the original place of these blocks right away. Every legend, every mythology has a core of truth. And that is my quest. Casey, thank you very much for your time. There is now very little doubt in my mind that Puma Punku was built with some sort of extraterrestrial technology and that its destruction was probably caused by a great flood, perhaps the same flood that is described in the Old Testament. This has been an amazing journey. And while I'm even more convinced that mankind had alien ancestors, I need to find more evidence. And so this is why I'm off once again in search of aliens. I'm on my way to explore one of the most ancient and mysterious islands in the world, Malta. It was here that a prehistoric society built megalithic structures using massive blocks. These blocks were arranged into complex designs and are considered by scholars to be older than the Great Pyramid in Egypt. But after a period of 1,000 years, all activity on Malta stopped and any trace of the people who built these incredible structures vanished. But why? There are stories that say Malta was once home to giants and even a race of legendary one-eyed creatures known as Cyclops. Could these stories offer clues as to what really happened on the islands of Malta? And if so, could there also be a connection to ancient astronauts? My name is Giorgio Tsoukalos. I explore the world that exists between reality and speculation, the known and the unknown. What we've been taught by mainstream scholars is not the whole picture. But I'm convinced that every day we are one step closer to the truth. I've traveled almost 7,000 miles to a place that has puzzled archaeologists for more than a century. Lying just south of Sicily, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, the islands of Malta have been of strategic importance from the times of ancient Greece all the way through to the Second World War. This small and densely populated country covers only 122 square miles, but it is as rich with mystery as any place on Earth. The islands of Malta contain no less than seven megalithic structures 
and quite possibly they are the largest freestanding stones in the world. To this day, archaeologists struggle to explain how ancient people living on secluded islands were able to accomplish such incredible architectural feats. So I'm here to find out if there may be an explanation that the mainstream has not yet considered, one that possibly has a connection to giant one-eyed beings, the Cyclops. In the epic Greek poem, The Odyssey, written by Homer in the 8th century BC, the hero Odysseus encounters a cyclops named Polyphemus, a giant, one-eyed, human-like creature that, according to legend, was the son of Poseidon, the god of the seas. Now, while Homer never specified where the cyclops lived, there are some who believe that the giant monster and others of his kind might have actually dwelled right here, within Malta's megalithic structures. To begin my investigation, I went to examine Malta's famous so-called cart ruts, which some ancient astronaut theorists refer to as the Nazca Lines of Europe, because they are just as mysterious. There are over 100 sites on Malta that have these ruts or giant pairs of grooves in the rock, like the ones here at St. George's Bay on Malta's southeast coast. The mainstream theory on how these strange markings were formed is that the wheels of heavily laden carts compressed the limestone over a long period of time. Now, for that theory to be true, the wheels of the carts would have had to be of identical size and width. And they would have had to follow the exact same path over and over and over, never deviating. Otherwise, they would not form such precise ruts. But quite frankly, I think such a notion is nonsense. On average, these cart ruts are about 1.4 meters wide, which translates to about four feet and seven inches. So let's see how wide these are. So right here, these are a bit narrower. This is four feet and four inches, and from end to end, we're talking five feet and three inches. So it all depends how wide those tracks are. For example, right here, they're about three and a half inches, or actually three inches in this part, and then up here, and we have seven inches. So, if it were just a cart, then one could surmise that the width is the same at all times. So how were these deep and precise grooves made? And why? Perhaps there is a link between these strange markings and the stories of giants here on Malta. But how the grooves were made is only part of the mystery because these cart ruts go straight into the Mediterranean. Archaeologists are puzzled by this because divers have to determine that these cart ruts go about 42 meters into the sea, which is about 46 yards. One area located on Malta's southwest coast has so many mysterious ruts, a visiting Englishman nicknamed it after the busy Clapham Junction railway station in London. Hi. How you doing? Not so bad. Not so All bad. right. To help me find some answers, I've arranged to meet with author Gordon Weston, who wrote a book about the so-called cart ruts in 2010. Gordon, here we are at Clapham Junction. So, you know, lay it on me. Tell me what you think. Well, it's got a, what do you got, a half a lifetime? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Basically, you couldn't drive a cart down here. The cart would be wrecked. Early researchers looked at vehicles that would scrape away the rock because that's what it looks like has happened. There was three devices. The first one was a sledge, probably the oldest form of uh, human transport, but they found that the sledge immediately got stuck. 
So the two other devices have been looked at. Uh, one was a travoise used by the Plains Indians to transport their teepees from camp to camp. The problem is their poles will be wider than these ruts when they touch the ground. The next device is called a slide car. It's a load platform with two runners on it. This fanciful and ridiculous idea, practical experiments and that have seen that it just doesn't work. Gordon and I shared several different theories about the origin and purpose of the ruts, ranging from tracks used in the transportation of megalithic stone blocks to irrigation drains. But ultimately, every single one of these theories is problematic. Science is useless for this problem. There is no methodology which can be applied scientifically to these ruts. There's no way a block could be carried by a vehicle at the time the temples were um, built. The first temple was built in 3500 BC. A wheeled vehicle had only just come into existence then. It certainly wouldn't have been on Malta. Malta was still in the deep Neolithic at that point. The presence of these ruts all over Malta is truly inexplicable. And there is one other aspect I took note of at St. George's Bay that baffles me most of all. So in St. George's Bay, in a city called Bersabuja, there are a couple of ruts that go straight into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, they are famous, you're right. It is uh, interesting to see that ruts go into the sea. They also said to have come up on the other side of the bay, but it's now built over. So how do you explain it? More and more, I'm convinced that the people living on Malta were much more technologically advanced than most mainstream scholars believe. But who were they? And how were they connected to ancient stories about bizarre one-eyed giants? I'm beginning to believe that these islands have been the home of a highly sophisticated civilization. A civilization that may have actually included extraterrestrials. I'm in the village of Crendi, about to meet with Dr. Anthony Bonanno, a professor of archaeology and classical literature at the University of Malta. Dr. Bonanno is one of the foremost experts on Malta's megalithic temples, so I'm excited to have him help me with my investigation. Hopefully, he can bring me closer to finding out whether or not a legendary race of one-eyed giants known as the Cyclops actually existed here, and if there might even be an extraterrestrial connection. I wanted to ask you if anyone believes that those prehistoric temples might have been built by giants. Yes, there is this association, even in Maltese folklore tradition, between the giants and the temples. There is a legend that the Gigantia temples in Goza were built by a giantess, a giant woman. Really? Yes. How old do you think the megalithic structures are? We can speak in terms of a bracket, certainly between 3600 BC and 2500 BC. There have been claims uh, that they could be older. If what Dr. Bonanno suggests is correct, then these Maltese megaliths are at least 1,000 years older than the Great Pyramid of Giza. But after seeing Malta's mysterious ruts running straight into the sea, I believe they may date back even further. Perhaps I'll find more evidence at the first site Dr. Bonanno is taking me to, the temples of Manidra, located on the rugged and isolated south coast of Malta. This complex consists of three stone structures that are laid out in the pattern of a trefoil. That is to say, structures which have three interconnected circular chambers. Malta is a fairly small island, but the ratio of how many megalithic temples exist here on this island is astounding. So why such a small island and that many prehistoric megalithic temples? This is a question which we find difficult to, to answer. The concentration is normally 
um, attributable to some sort of internal rivalry, uh, which spurred on this mad idea of building one temple after another. A mad idea, I like that. You know, people have been possessed to build this. The people must have had a compelling reason to carry all these stones, to put them into place. Do you think this structure was built with anything astronomical in mind, with observing of the constellations? It has been confirmed that the entrance is actually uh, orientated towards the rising sun at the equinoxes. But you have also similar alignments in the solstices where the, ray of the rising sun hit the edge of these blocks here. In his paper, Monaidra, a calendar in stone, Maltese investigator Paul Mitalev concluded that Monaidra was built around 10,200 BC. He came to this conclusion because, based on the tilt of the Earth at that point in time, on the morning of the summer solstice, a beam of light would have come through the main entrance of the Monaidra temple and been cast directly on the center of an altar stone. The only way this could be achieved is if the monolith at Monaidra was placed specifically and precisely with the end effect in mind. Now what fascinates me is the fact that megalithic structures can be found all over the world. And most were carefully constructed to align with the sun. In Macedonia, for example, there's an ancient site known as the Kokino Observatory, which features four stone thrones at the top of a mountain, positioned to track the solstices and equinoxes. In Machu Picchu, there is a stone temple with three trapezoidal windows, also positioned to align with the sun during the solstices and equinoxes. Legends say that by looking through them, the mind can connect with other realms. But perhaps the most fascinating connection of all can be found on the northwest coastline of France. Here, a collection of over 3,000 massive rocks called the Karnak Stones align with both the summer and winter solstices. But even more incredible are ancient legends that claim that the standing stones were actually placed there by giants, just like the legends of giants we find in Malta. What are some of the biggest blocks that you're aware of that have once existed here? We have much larger stones. We have one particular one at, at Hajar Im, which is um, estimated to weigh about 20 tons. And we have a series of them uh, of the same order uh, up in Gigantia in Gozo. That's just mind-boggling, really yes, amazing yes, stuff. Uh, Between cart ruts that go into the sea and a megalithic temple that could date back more than 10,000 years, I'm beginning to see just how Malta could connect to stories about a race of one-eyed giants known as the Cyclops. But before I can draw any conclusions, I still need to gather more evidence. I'm exploring the tiny Mediterranean islands of Malta, looking for evidence that the legendary Cyclops may have lived here thousands of years ago. As my search for clues continues, Dr. Bonanno is now taking me to the temple of Hajar Im, which contains what is possibly the largest monolith on the island. What does Hajar Im actually so, mean? Hajar means stones, and Im could either be uh, worship uh, or else standing. So, stones of worship or standing stone. Like this one? There you are, yes. Check this out, this is huge. Yes, wow. uh, three meters high by six meters 50 wide and about another meter thick. That makes about 20 odd tons. Minimum. Minimum, yes. 20 tons is around 40,000 pounds. That's the combined weight of 16 mid-sized cars. I'm always fascinated by the fact that giant monoliths were erected by various ancient cultures all over the world. For example, you can find them at Stonehenge in England, 
Karahunj in southern Armenia, and even as far away as Easter Island. So you have to ask yourself how and why were so-called technologically primitive people erecting these enormous stone monoliths without the help of any large machinery. This is incredible. So this is one of the largest freestanding stones. I mean, you know, when I see stuff like this, that's when I wonder, yeah, how, you know, how did they how carry it? How did it? They, they quarried it in this case? Yeah, they must have quarried and it. And put upright. put it upright, yes. Yeah, I mean, so how do you think these stones were brought here? Yes, they must have been dragged on a, a spread of roller stones. While some mainstream archaeologists suggest that giant blocks of stone were moved from quarries to the temples with the use of carts that ran along the so-called cart ruts, others claim that they were moved by placing them on the top of stone balls and hauling them across the countryside. But while it's true that a number of spherical stones have been found at Malta's megalithic temples, it still doesn't explain why such enormous stones were even used in the first place. You know, when I see this, I mean, it's just this massive rock, but you know, the, the weight, I just don't know if the spheres would have withstood the weight. 20 yes. tons yes. of, yes. because the spheres were, were made of limestone too, right? And the rough surface would explain why these spheres were of actually different sizes, mm -hmm. different diameters, but we have but never still discovered. bringing it here and then just, yes, you know, heave it. heaving it up. That is another Incredible. one, yeah. It's yes, like yes, just yes. this obelisk just standing yes, about uh, more than 15 Marvel, feet, yeah. 16 feet uh, tall. Mm -hmm. I'm still in awe of the size and complexity of Hajar-Im. I mean, a 17-foot-tall monolith? How did supposedly primitive Stone Age people move something this enormous? Today, we would use the most advanced of heavy machinery. And so, the idea that some other type of technology was used becomes very plausible. And the idea that these structures today are considered to be temples implies worship. Who did they worship? The gods. Well, in my opinion, that is when the questioning begins, because we have to then ask ourselves, who were these gods? So, there's something else I would like to show yeah? you. Um, right. yeah. I'm excited to explore the interior of Hajar Im, because there is something I've heard about within this structure that leads some ancient astronaut theorists to believe that this temple dates back much earlier than 3600 BC. If this proves to be true, it could fall in line with the evidence I've already discovered that could indicate a civilization existed on Malta as far back as 12,000 years ago. Right, uh, so beyond a long corridor, covered corridor, we open up into a uh, courtyard flanked uh, by two apses, one on each side, and each apse is accessible through a porthole entrance. That's one, and on the opposite side we have another one here, okay, with the usual rope holes, and it is in this place that the famous Venus of Malta about that size was discovered. So this is where it was discovered? Right, right. Okay. According to Dr. Bonanno, many mainstream scholars believe the Venus of Malta is approximately 5,000 years old. But I find that very hard to believe because this clay figurine bears a striking similarity to one I've seen that is much, much older. In 1908, almost 70 years after the Venus of Malta was discovered, a nearly identical statuette was found in Austria called the Venus of Willendorf. It bears uncanny similarities to the Venus of Malta in both subject matter and its exaggerated style. But what I also find truly incredible is that the Venus of Willendorf has been determined to be at least 25,000 years old. The implications of this are truly staggering because if the Venus of Malta is 25,000 years old, 
then that would suggest that the entire megalithic structure known as Hajar-Im could very likely also be from this same era. Now, while I've yet to find concrete proof that the Cyclops really existed here in Malta, I see more and more evidence that the incredible structures here are much older than what most mainstream scholars believe. But what exactly does this all mean? In 1902, a strange underground temple known as the Hypogeum of Halsefliani was discovered on Malta. The first archaeological investigations at the site turned up more than 7,000 skeletons. And according to a National Geographic magazine article from May 1920, many were found to be, and I quote, long skulled. I hope that Mario Kasha, an executive of Heritage Malta, can help me find out where the skulls are now and if there could be a connection to strange legends of one-eyed giants. So tell me how this place is unique in the world. Even today, there are still a lot of questions to be answered. There's no writing at all in, in our prehistory, and nothing to really give us a hint of, of what actually happened here. Gradually, we started to learn more of the site and what happened in these archaeological sites that we have here all over the island, spread out. There are over 33 other megalithic sites, but this is the only one ever found, which is to be underground. It was a burial site from the amount of bones that were found here and also a place for worship. How many human remains were found here? We give a figure of about 7,000 human remains, but obviously it must have been much more because the estimate was given from just one area. The, most probably the, the idea was that these burial chambers were reused and reused, moving away the older bones and putting in fresh corpses. The idea that this was a burial ground and that multiple remains were found possibly in the thousands, where have those remains ended up? I mean, where are they? Do you have any ideas? You've got the uh, Second World War. All these were moved out. It's a tragedy that more than 7,000 ancient skeletons were supposedly lost. But I have actually seen an old grainy photo of some of them, and they definitely appeared to have elongated skulls, similar to those found in ancient Egypt and as far away as Peru. Luckily, a few of the elongated skulls that were found in the Hypogeum were sent to Malta's National Museum of Archaeology shortly after they were discovered. In 1907, they were put on display and caused a sensation. Many believe that they offered proof that the stories of giants inhabiting Malta were true. Some even speculated that the skulls were of extraterrestrial origin. I'm really stoked to go and check out the archaeology museum here in Valletta because who knows, maybe they will allow me to see those skulls. Check this out. That's a model of the Hypogeum. So you can see how vast of a complex it is with spiral staircases, the different levels, and all hewn out of the bedrock. I mean, how cool is this? It's interesting to come up with different ideas, but once you see the whole extent of it, some explanations all of a sudden don't make any sense. Very cool stuff. Are you Vanessa? Yes. Pleasure to meet you. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. This is great. The Archaeology Museum holds interesting artifacts from Malta's megalithic sites, including the remains of what looks like the statue of a giant female, and even an oversized cup. But today, I'm here to investigate the mysterious skulls. 
you know, I was just at the Hypogeum and they actually recommended that I should come and talk to you about some skulls that have been found there. So, would you allow me to see those? Of course, I will show them to you in yeah. my office. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. What an incredible privilege. When 11 skulls found in the Hypogeum were examined in 1912, they were found to have significant differences from normal human skulls. I mean, this is wild. So, these belong to the Temple period, so we're speaking about 5,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. They were found 100 years ago. Looking at the difference of this skull and these here, it seems as if it's like an elongated shape and there are certain cultures, for example, in ancient Egypt or in Peru, where you actually find these elongated skulls. In 1928, 300 elongated skulls were discovered in Paracas, Peru, and were estimated to be more than 3,000 years old. Now, mainstream archaeologists believe that elongated skulls were achieved by ancient people wrapping boards around the heads of infants shortly after birth to create an appearance of nobility. But ancient astronaut theorists have another interpretation, one that suggests that some of the skulls were an attempt to emulate or copy the so-called gods. As you can see, even from the inside, there's no sign of the middle suture. Right. Completely fused. That's fascinating. The bones of the human skull are joined together by sutures, joints formed by ossification. The sagittal suture connects the sides and roof of the cranium. This suture is open when a person is born and closes around the age of 35. But the hypogeum skull seems to not have a sagittal suture. But how and why? These skulls are referred to as the elongated skulls. Like you said, this one in particular especially, seems to be longer, which is quite unusual. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's quite a lot of mystery about them. In fact, we've been accused many times of keeping them secret because they're the remains, the, the evidence. Yeah, why, why are these not on display? They aren't on display yet. Yet. Unfortunately, they haven't been studied yet. They were discovered about 100 years ago. That's the first thing you should study right here. So are there any plans of potentially doing any DNA testing on these to determine the origin and things like that? Unfortunately, these have been handled many times. And some of them, most particularly this one, if you look inside, it's filled with plaster of Paris. Unfortunately, this would make it highly contaminated. And it's not worth destroying such unique artifacts to get data which is, which is not reliable. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, this has been fascinating beyond words. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, if anything happens with these skulls, let me know. I'm okay, definitely curious to learn more. I can't believe I just saw those skulls. The fact that they've been discovered a hundred years ago and they have not been further investigated blows my mind. I know this is speculative, I know that, but what if what we have there is an extraterrestrial skull? Because that missing suture is very strange. To gain more insight, I'm meeting with Professor Hubert Seitelmeier, founder of the Malta Discovery Prehistory Research Foundation. Professor Zeitelmeier has been looking for proof of ancient alien contact on Malta for over two decades. He's taking me to the final stop of my investigation, the Temple of the Giants on the island of Gozo.
you know, it's really cool to go to Gozo, but I wanted to show you these photos that I took of these weird skulls that apparently were found at the Hypogeum a hundred years ago. And here, this one is missing the main suture that goes across the ridge of the head. Congratulations. <laughs> it is incredible that you could see this. You are one of the few lucky ones. Normally, they are hidden for the public. I tried to make a DNA test, but I was unable to make the test because they hide it. Do you think that these things might be extraterrestrials, or do you think they're hybrids? They are hybrids, made half and half, but made by the extraterrestrials. So they are much older than 6,000 years. So how many years do you propose uh, we're talking here? I would say we talk about 160,000 years. Based on the strange shape of the skulls, Professor Zeitlmeier believes that they date back between 100 and 200,000 years ago to the time when the first Homo sapiens sapiens emerged. And it is also around this time that many ancient astronaut theorists have suggested that extraterrestrial beings first made contact with humans and altered the course of history. Now, although these skulls are clearly too small to belong to giants like the Cyclops, could they represent something even more profound? Could they be the actual skulls of ancient astronauts? It's all a very interesting investigation to me. If in the end it has something to do with giants or not, I know this. something happened. I mean, look at these stones over here. Professor Hubert Seitelmeier and I have arrived on the island of Gozo to explore the Temple of Gigantia. According to legend, Gigantia, or the Temple of the Giants, owes its magnificence and its name to the strength of a giantess named Sansuna. And apparently she carried the huge stone boulders on her shoulders while carrying her baby under her arm while building this structure right here. During my visit to the Temple of Hajar-Im, Dr. Bonanno had explored the idea that limestone spheres may have been used to move the massive stones into position. But Professor Zeitlmeier has an alternative theory, one that I've never heard before. He believes that the stone balls were used to protect the temples in the event of earthquakes. So you think that these stone spheres were actually used in order to hold these blocks in place? Yes. Sometime in the floor, there are holes in the floor, and there are the bowls with the right size, and they are fit into the hole. Right. And then we have the half hole here, half hole here. And we put it together. On top of the stone, there are always holes too. Well, and then you put the balls into these holes and then you fit the cover stone. And there it fits. Okay, so it skips. This cannot fall down anymore. So the giants did mean with this type of construction, they made the building for a turning. But I think this is great. I mean, this would explain the idea of what these stones were or these spheres were used for. This actually is a very ingenious solution to a, uh, an enigma. Just as some modern skyscrapers are built on rolling bases to minimize the impact of earthquakes, Dr. Zeitlmeier believes that the top and bottom of each monolith was designed with a hole carved out containing a limestone sphere. This would allow the stones to slide and roll and not break apart when tremors shook the islands. So it's clear that they had the knowledge to build these structures. And then all of a sudden, not only did they stop to build in this megalithic style, but also it seems as if the knowledge was lost. In my opinion, the reason the knowledge was lost is the flood. 
12,000 years ago. But after the flood, they did not have the technology anymore to move these big stone blocks. I'm blown away by what Professor Zeitelmeier just told me. And now I think I can finally make the connection I've been looking for between the islands of Malta and a race of one-eyed giants known as the Cyclops. During my visit to the Temple of Gigantia on Gozo, Professor Hubert Zeitelmeier proposed that the early inhabitants of Malta were wiped out by the Great Flood, the same flood that is described in the Old Testament. In my opinion, the reason the knowledge was lost is the flood, because all the intelligent people were killed. And I remember that you proposed that this flood or one of these cataclysms happened many thousands of years ago. So how long ago do you propose that was, perhaps? The sin flood had happened 12,000 years ago. So it is common known in natural sciences that the Ice Age did abruptly stop about 12 or 11,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And this was the reason this culture stopped abruptly, immediately out. So all that what they did after the flood is very low in education and in level. And that is why we can see the different building styles because you have the megalithic blocks and then you have smaller stones like this where that is very odd because you can clearly see the different styles and while archaeology tries to tell us that the smaller stones were used first, in reality it was just the opposite, that the megalithic style was first and everything else that followed was smaller because we can see that in many structures in different parts of the world where at the bottom you have the megalithic blocks and then everything that came on top was smaller stones. It's true. Professor Zeitelmeier's theory confirms my idea that civilization existed on Malta more than 12,000 years ago, before the time of the so-called Great Flood. This would help explain why the cart ruts extended into the sea, because they would have been made at a time when the water levels around the world were lower. And according to most scientists, the water levels around the world were lower between 10,000 and 11,000 BC, just before the end of the last ice age. In the ancient Hebrew text known as the Book of Enoch, which a few Christian denominations included as part of the Bible, it is written that God created a great flood to wipe out a race of giants known as the Nephilim. These giants were said to be strange beings, the offspring of the rebellious or fallen angels mating with human women. Now, according to the ancient astronaut theory, what the Bible often refers to as angels are, in fact, flesh and blood extraterrestrials. I mean, this is, this is some really interesting information. I have to now digest it. So it's been a great honor to, to listen to you and to uh, hear about your ideas and theories because not too many people talk about what you talk about. So thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. So if ancient stories about the Cyclops living on Malta are true, and since there is evidence that suggests that there was a civilization on Malta more than 12,000 years ago, then it is possible that the Nephilim and the Cyclops could be one and the same, and that they were a race of alien-human hybrids that inhabited the Earth before the time of the Great Flood. I think Malta still has many more incredible secrets to reveal and much to tell us about mankind's extraterrestrial origins. But in the meantime, I'm off once again in search of aliens. I'm on my 
away to Roswell, New Mexico, which is ground zero for modern day UFO researchers. It's very exciting to go to a city that's steeped in alien lore. But I'm not going there to investigate the Roswell crash site because that's been done a thousand times before. My mission involves a much more recent discovery. I'm headed out in search of the Roswell Rock. My name is Giorgio Tsoukalos. I explore the world that exists between reality and speculation, the known and the unknown. What we've been taught by mainstream scholars is not the whole picture. But I'm convinced that every day we are one step closer to the truth. On July 7th, 1947, an unidentified object crashed on a ranch just outside the town of Roswell, New Mexico. The next day, the local newspaper announced that officials from the Army airfield had reported the capture of a quote-unquote flying saucer. But just a few hours later, the military revised that statement to say the object was nothing more than a weather balloon. According to reports, the government removed all debris from the site of the crash. And to this day, not a single piece of evidence has been recovered. Now this to me is the most fascinating part of the story because the object that I'm here to investigate was found near the vicinity of the crash site. So what if it is the one piece of evidence the military missed? You. Good, thanks. What can I get you to drink? Uh, some coffee, please. Would you like cream? No, oh, just black. Okay. Thank you. What brings you to Roswell, New Mexico? I'm meeting a guy who might have potentially found an alien artifact, so I'm here to investigate. Really? <laughs> You're not the first one to ever say that walking into this Ever, store. right? <laughs> Never. A local man named Robert Ridge discovered the Roswell Rock about 10 years ago while tracking deer in the desert. And he found right near the area where the UFO allegedly crashed in 1947. Now the Roswell Rock is this small triangular shaped rock of brown color. It has this design on top of it that isn't etched into the rock, but it actually protrudes from it. And it's interesting to me that most people I meet in Roswell have never even heard of this rock. Robert? Hey, Giorgio, pleasure to meet you. Thanks so much for coming out and meeting me. That's great. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Have a seat. Yeah. How are you folks? Good, how are you today? Good, good. Can I get you something to drink? Uh, some iced tea, please. Lemon? Please. Did you bring the rock? Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, wow. I did not expect this level of detail. It is smaller than I had expected. Definitely heavier than I expected. I mean, the precision is... Wow. The Roswell Rock reminds me of precision cut rocks I've seen before in other parts of the world, like the obelisks in Egypt or Ollantaytambo in Peru. Are there any strange properties to this rock? It, it has some type of magnetic field in it. Um, a magnetic field? Yeah. How do you mean? Yeah. Well, it, it reacts to a magnet. Did you bring a magnet? Sure. I happen to have my magic okay. wand with me here. It might spin for me today, I don't know for sure, but. Oh, wow. That's interesting. 
Let me see if I can. Does anybody? Does it work with anybody, or is it work, does it only work with you? Well, I'm. I guess I'm probably better at it than most. Wow. That is sure strange. And and is this the only space where it makes it spin? No. It. The other. Uh, circle. It does we'll, it over here we'll, as well. We'll send it counter. We'll send it clockwise. Oh wow! Yeah. There's something else you might find interesting. You mess with something long enough, you pretty much learn everything about it. Yeah. You know? And so, I was messing with it one day, and I got it to where it was. It kind of draws to my other hand. You know, it's. I try to keep this hand as still as I can, and this. So it's almost reacting with your body energy. Yeah. That is wild. Well. Would you be opposed to show me where you found the rock? Oh, no, I'm up for that. Big yeah, time. really? Oh, yeah. All yeah, right. Let's go. Check, please. <laughs> so what do you do for a living? Well, I, I've been in the paint and body business, you know, for basically all my life. I've owned my own shops. Oh, that's cool. Excellent. All right, now you're going to need to take a ride up here, and then when you come around, you'll kind of see the right. terminal up there. A lot of history here. This air base. In the 40s, it was the SAC base, Strategic Air Command. This is the place that uh, they brought the debris from the 47 crash. This is the place. So, this is it. so yeah. Hangar 84 must be around here. Off over here somewhere, I believe. Hangar 84 is where the military allegedly took the debris and alien bodies after the crash in 1947, before eventually moving them to another location. It's kind of surreal to be walking on the same tarmac. So here's our pilot. How you doing? Are we ready to go? We're ready to go. Are you guys right. ready? Absolutely. OK, let's get moving. Sweet. Firing up the engine. Let the adventure begin. relation to where you found the rock. It's 11 miles, what we call the skip site. Yeah. And what do you mean by the skip site? It's where the crosser made contact with the ground first, left a uh, massive debris field, and then proceeded back towards the mountain to where it finally came to rest. Why do people believe that that is the spot? Jim Ragsdale and his girlfriend were up here camping. They actually saw the craft come in and were the first ones on the scene. That's why they call it the Rackdale site. They supposedly saw the, the bodies and everything. There it is, right here. Where's the spot? This is it, right here? Yeah. Wow. So this is the trail I was on. And what brought you out here? This is uh, deer country, you know? This is in the right seasons, the right time of year, the deer are just thick in here. I saw fresh deer tracks across the road in front of me, so I thought I need to get out and follow these tracks. So I get out and start following the tracks, and they bring me around through here. I look over up on that edge there, and it's there it sets. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, rock doesn't really fit in, and it looks like it has a design on it. You go ahead and place it where you found it. Sure. I'd say probably like that. Yeah. A lot of people might have walked by it, but I'm not a lot of people, I don't guess. Right, right. <laughs> And so that's how it was. You know, it was in 04 also, so this has changed a, a, a little bit. It, the sand looks like it's a little bit darker in here right now. I can totally see now that it does stand out from the environment. So do you think there's a connection between the crash and finding this rock right here? I think it's possible. You know, the, the skip site is this direction. Um, it was a massive debris field from 
you know, all accounts uh, that was left behind. And so if it was moving that fast, you know, um, to skip off the ground like a rock on the water, um, why couldn't that have been thrown this far, you know? Um, you know, the government pretty, did a pretty thorough sweep of this country um, when that happened. And um, maybe they missed something, I don't know. But I thought it was special from the very first moment it hit my hand. The military allegedly spent months recovering debris, but the sand out here is constantly shifting. So it's very easy to see how they could have missed something as small as the Roswell Rock. Now what I want to do too is I want to see if we can find maybe some similar rocks around here so we can, you know, draw a comparison. Great, I'm always up for hunting a rock. All right. There's some rocks right over there. All I see is some rocks that are the same color like the sand, but it's definitely not the same, that's for sure because you, you compare that, and I mean, it's not, even, it's not even the same category. Not a whole lot out here to resembles it in any way. So I wanna put these in my bag, and so, you know, over the next couple of days, I wanna definitely mull over what happened today, and I'm gonna go ahead and do some investigations on my own. So let's head back to the chopper. Let's do it. So I'm on my way to Albuquerque, to see Linda Moulton Howe, an investigative journalist who has done extensive research, not only on the original Roswell incident, but also on the Roswell Rock. I have read on Earth Files that there is a clear uh, connection between a crop circle that was found in 1996 in England and also the Roswell Rock. Pretty much the two designs are identical. What can you tell me about that? At first I thought, it, it, could it really be identical? And we can do a comparison here. Now on the left is the rock, the actual rock in its pattern. And on the right is the crop formation in wheat, 120 feet long. And when you take each item, you can measure it across. They're exactly identical. Wow. So you clearly think that the crop circle wasn't man-made. In this one particular case, they had a pilot and a passenger who said that they had flown over the field and there was nothing there, and they flew back over. Couldn't have been more than a half hour, and here was this pattern. There were four layers thick where the crop was layered as one direction would flow and meet another, and another direction would come over, and there's no board, string, foot, nothing can do that. It was one of the most perfect, clean lays that anyone had ever seen, meaning perfection. What's the significance of this? I mean, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing. Basically, we're dealing with lunar astronomy the moon and the sun and the tracking of the symbols. This is reflecting past, present, and future. This is relating to space and time that moving through the universe has got to be on a uh, point to point bending space time that quantum physicists have talked about. I really do think something the capital S is trying to teach us humans. Now, the fact that we have equal but opposite images of what appears to be the sun and the moon brings to mind a concept from the ancient Hindu texts known as the Vedas, and that is, as above, so below. In other words, what happens here on Earth is connected directly to what happens up there in the sky. The very fact that Robert Ridge's rock would have these magnetic properties that would spin clockwise and counterclockwise. Was it constructed that way by some intelligence? Was it a fluke of nature? And Giorgio, no one has proved this rock to be a hoax. Linda, I thank you very much for this conversation. The information that I've learned this afternoon has that been absolutely invaluable. Thanks very thank much. Thank you.
Honestly, I really thought that this rock might be some fake. But after seeing it in person and after talking to Linda, I'm beginning to think that what we have here could be something quite extraordinary. So now it's time to put the Roswell rock through some serious scientific tests. One of the biggest questions concerning the Roswell rock is whether or not the design on it is man-made. And those who claim it is say that because the design rises out of the rock, the most likely way that it would have been made is not with laser cutting or machining, but with a process known as sandblasting, which can be used to cut away the rock around the design. All right, let's go. Let's check this out. So Robert and I decided to meet with a stone cutter to put this theory to the test. Hey, David, guys. how you doing? I'm Giorgio. Pleasure Giorgio. to meet you. Okay. How are you? Glad to meet Robert you. Robert Reed, David. Glad, Glad, to meet you. Glad to meet you. So what do you have set up for us here today? Well, I'm trying to see if I can make a rock that looks like a Roswell rock. So you're going to try to replicate this item here? Exactly. I'm going to try to show you all how we do this. What processes will you be using? We'll be using the stencils, cutting, and the sandblasting. OK, that's awesome. I got a head start. I copied the design, traced it, put it on a computer, ran it through our computer system, and cut the design. Cut it in a few different sizes. And uh, of course, all I had to go uh, was buy this picture. So you can get a pretty good tracing off of that. Robert actually brought the Roswell Rock, so if you want to give yeah, the rock would help help you out some. Check uh, it out. What are your impressions right now? Do you feel anything? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't blame you. What are your thoughts? Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's got a. Some markings right there around it's, that edge that are a little deeper. It's a 90 degree there, and then it bevels around from the, this side. It's got this cup in the bottom here. Very interesting. Thank you. Every one of those cuts and every one of those are, are achievable by man. Give it your best shot. Stencil off. First one finished gets a prize. Oh, I'm, I was done. done five minutes ago, yes. Oh, mine's, <laughs> mine's 10 times bigger. Now, I think that uh, this here, as a piece of art and, that you've just created, it looks awesome, but it does not match the Roswell rock. Well, of course, it's a different rock. These are perfect circles here and, and perfect cuts. Okay. I could take my little tool and I could make perfect circles. If you had to, you can take and knock off those little edges. It's simply not the same. I mean, this is an incredible creation, yet this and that, to me right now, is different. And I know you had a half an hour to do this, that, you, you know, I mean... Make sure for my reputation you say that. <laughs> that I only no, had no, a half no, an hour. No. Of course. This was supposed to be the ultimate proof that uh, this is a sandblasted piece. I got to tell you, Robert, I am more intrigued now than I was <laughs> in the previous days. All right, All right David. Thank you, Thank you very time. much for opening up your shop for us. Anytime. All right, Thank take you. care. Thank See you. ya. Thank you, sir. The sandblasted replicas appear very different to the naked eye, but Robert and I are going to take an even closer look under a microscope. We're meeting with geoarchaeologist Dr. Bill Dolman, a man who has been studying rocks for over 30 years. 
in order to get an expert opinion on just what type of rock the Roswell rock might be. You must be Giorgio. I am. This is Dr. Bill Doman. Giorgio. Bill Doman, pleasure to meet you. Pleasure How are to you? meet you, sir. And Robert? Hi, Bill. Pleasure to see you again. You too. We're here to look at the Roswell rock. Now, I know you've seen this rock mm -hmm. before, but we're here to draw some comparisons with some other rocks that we found in the area mm -hmm. and also a sandblasted piece that we had done earlier. So here's the rock, and then we're going to look at this under the microscope today, right? We're going to look at it under a microscope, and we're going to talk about whether that rock could have come from there naturally or not. I can't wait to see this under high magnification. Me neither. <laughs> Good. Now, you found this where? Well, at the base of the Capitan Mountain. OK. Let's take a look at the geology map here. So then it would From be Roswell. It's... Here's Roswell. And here's the Capitan Mountains right mm -hmm. here. So we're smack in the middle of a whole bunch of blue. The blue is limestone. Now, this rock doesn't look like limestone to me. So right off the bat, it seems kind of unusual and out of place. Now, did you get any rocks from the I area? I did, absolutely. We collected some right here. Oh, you guys are real scientists. Well, we do what we can do, you know? I play the sorting game here pretty quickly. Do some high-powered scientific tests. Mm -hmm. Now, this is limestone. You see, I can easily cut it with the point of a knife. You're cutting into this Y, so you can determine the, the hardness? Test the hardness, exactly. Okay. Limestone generally can be scratched with the point of a knife. What I find striking, Question though... Question is, where did that come from? Exactly, because this totally falls out of line with everything that we have mm -hmm. here. So right. why do you think that is, or what is your hunch on what this might actually be? Basically, it's what geologists would call a pebble. It's rounded, and that kind of rounding is very typical of stones that you find in a stream. So anyway, what's interesting to me is that this is a uniform color all over, and that's very unusual. As you can see, any one of these rocks has got different colors in different parts. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this might have potentially been painted? There's some coat of paint on there. I'll tell you what I would like to do. In fact, I've got the device right here. I often use this to um, just grind down and polish the surface mm -hmm. of a rock to give myself a clean, polished surface to go through the patina or whatever is on there to really look at the rock's structure using a microscope. Robert, what do you think? Oh, hell no. Uh -uh. No, that thing ain't gonna work. <laughs> well, I didn't think so, and, and actually, it, so for all intents and purposes, this is a foreign object to this particular region. Even not looking at the design, yes, it looks like it's Oh, we haven't even talked different. about the design yet. Exactly. Well, it keeps <laughs> looking at me, you know. Yeah, well, but yeah, it's I mean, hard to know, miss that when you aside. Kind of, yeah. Earlier, we went out there to meet with a sandblaster, and he was 100% convinced that this is a sandblasted piece. A fabrication. Yes, and so what he did was he created these replicas right here, and we brought them to you for comparison. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that these are both some kind of plastic sedimentary rock. I'm gonna get it set up and you guys can take a look here. All right, why don't you guys take a look? See what you see. Yeah, you can definitely see a difference between the, the two surface. structure of the rock. Yes. Mm -hmm. but now, let's put the Roswell rock under this, because that's what we came here for, to look at this under magnification. Oh, wow. This is wild. The edges are so clean. I mean, it's as if this was carved with some type of a very fine knife. Wow. It's crazy, huh? <laughs> I'll say. 
I mean, this is not even the same ballpark as the sandblast pieces. I mean, here is the crazy thing. I've seen edges like this before at Puma Punku. Puma Punku is a site in Bolivia that many scholars believe is more than 10,000 years old. There you can find dozens of giant granite rocks that appear to be cut with extraordinary precision. Now, no one has ever been able to explain how supposedly primitive people would have accomplished this using copper and chicken bones. But according to the local native legends, they say that the stones weren't carved by humans at all, but by the gods. Looking at the Roswell Rock under magnification, I'm beginning to think it's possible that this is not a carving made by some science fiction fan, but it appears to be the result of some type of advanced technology, whatever it may have been. Now, could it be man-made? I still, of course, cannot rule that out. To my mind, I'm seeing it almost looks as if that was clay that got carved with a very fine instrument. Yeah, that's, that's, uh... I mean, it's extraordinary. As a scientist, what would you recommend for our next tests? Well, I think we need to look inside the rock, and we need to evaluate two things. One, it's got a magnetic field, apparently. We'd like to know more about the origins of it. Two, we're not really sure whether it's multiple pieces, whether it has a magnet inside it. So I got a friend who's an electrical engineer, and he has access to some very high-grade testing equipment for measuring magnetic fields. Second of all, I've got a friend who has a, a CT scanner, and that's basically a three-dimensional x-ray of the rock. And so we'll learn all sorts of things about the inside of that rock. We're not done yet. No, the investigation has just begun because I am definitely intrigued, so. Thanks you again. Too. Appreciate it. Have a safe trip. I'll Take see you guys soon. All right. Bye-bye. The next step in solving the mystery of the Roswell Rock is to find out why it spins when brought in contact with a magnet. Dr. Dolman has arranged for a meeting with an electrical engineer, Nathan Menhorn, and he has agreed to bring a whole bunch of sophisticated instruments from his lab to his garage where we can bring the rock and perform magnetic field tests. So Nathan, Robert showed me that with a simple magnet he was able to make the Roswell rock spin. So there are some type of magnetic properties we want to figure out if uh, we can use some more sophisticated instruments to determine whether or not there's really something interesting about this particular rock that we have here. It'd be kind of interesting to know, A, is there really a magnetic field there? B, what is its strength? And C, what's its orientation inside the rock? What uh, tests do we have lined up today? Okay, so the first test that I'd like to do is measure the field strength of the rock. Cool. Let's get started. All right. Show us the goods. Okay. So we want to calibrate the magnetometer first to make sure we're getting accurate readings. And what is this black thing right now? What? what, what? This just isolates the, the uh, probe from any magnetic field. Okay. Now. On the tip of the rock, we have about one up. half to 0.8 gauss, so we'll call it about 0.8. On this end, close to zero there, close to zero there. So the field is going to be coming out of here. So this is this would be the North Pole of the magnet, and this would be the south pole. So with the north pole, we're getting a positive reading mm -hmm. because the magnetic field is coming out, and it's coming back around and going into the south pole. So let's probe around a little bit more and see what else we can see. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 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 Yeah, so look at that. Eight. All right, now that's 7.8 seconds. Point eight. 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 Okay. We gotta be near a polar, right? It's getting higher. This is getting weird. It's a symbol. 
that does it. Whoa. Wow. And we it got is an the 11. thickest part of the rock. We got an 11 right over the, over the fracture. We oh. got an 11.3. The edge of the design. That is pretty amazing. There are some rocks found in nature that contain magnetite or other magnetic minerals, like a lodestone, for instance, which the ancient Olmecs in Mexico actually used as a compass over 3,000 years ago. But I do find very curious that the magnetism in the Roswell rocks seems to be concentrated in one area. If there is an, a magnet, let's say, artificially embedded, mm -hmm. then it would be right underneath this area right here. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you could imagine, that there, there might be a magnet inside? Yes, there could be. It's, it's very, very, very okay. possible. After Nathan suggested that there may actually be a magnet planted inside the rock, I was more determined than ever to cut into it to verify that it is, in fact, a solid rock and not some plaster cast made from a mold or painted. And so reluctantly, actually, very reluctantly, Robert agreed to let us use a grinder on the backside of the rock. We're going to find something out about this rock. I think you have amazing courage to let me do this, and I greatly appreciate it as well. But I want you to have one last chance to say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't do this. Last chance. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. You are the man, Robert. Wow. Here we go. It's hard. I'm going to try one more shot of grinding and collect the dust that comes off of there in case we want to analyze it later. I think we need to uh, do any more grinding. Robert was genuinely affected by us grinding into the Roswell rock. I mean, the guy was tearing up, and it's hard to imagine him doing that if he knew the rock was a fake. This rock isn't just a novelty to him, but it's almost as if it's a part of him. The grain or the fissure continues you can in, see, I, I can inside see in the there. natural yeah. rock, absolutely. So that kind of confirms one. Robert, one come over here. Yeah, Robert, you got to see this, buddy. You have to see this. Now, you, you know, I'm a bit emotional. It's OK. Right here, this is, this is a natural rock. There's no question that no paint has been applied to this. Okay. Yeah. Can, you can breathe now. If this thing was a plaster cast made from a mold, we would have found out about it right there. But whatever this thing was made up of is certainly much harder than plaster. And we now know that it was definitely not painted. This is a very, very fine-grained quartzitic sandstone. Magnetite has what we're looking for. I am going to go under the assumption that they are the little black flecks I'm seeing in here, although I expected them to see a lot more. Magnetite could explain the Roswell Rock's magnetic charge, but we found much less than what Dr. Dolman was originally expecting. But why does it have a magnetic charge at all? And one that's highly concentrated in one specific part of the rock's design? That is still a mystery. This is much finer grained than I expected it to be. So at this point in time, I'm going to say even with this power, short of thin sectioning the rock, it might be kind of hard to determine what it is just because it is so fine-grained. And so I think that when we look at the x-rays of this thing, we're going to have another chance to think about, well, is the inside different than what we can see having only shaved off about half a millimeter? Right. And thank you right. once again, Robert. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just thank you. got all sorts of pride in you for being willing to do this because... <laughs> I think a lot of times, you know, when push comes to shove, people back out. You didn't back out. You didn't, and that to me was the telltale sign. It was like, you know, because I was like holding back, and I was like, you know, well, no, what's this going to be? <laughs> if he takes that rock and says, like, I'm out of here. You didn't do that. Oh, I left the real one at home. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's what we know. 
We've established that the Roswell Rock isn't some fan-made ripoff. It's not plaster. It's not painted. It's a real stone with a finely carved design that cannot be easily reproduced. It's also magnetic, but we still don't know why exactly. So now we need to find out for sure if there isn't some little magnet or something hidden inside the rock that makes it move and spin the way it does. Well, this is a CAT scanner and it takes a beam of x-rays and passes them through a body and detects them, puts it through a computer and makes images that you can interpret. That's fantastic. Do you have to rock? Well, yeah. Let's do it. Wow. There it is. Whoa. Mm -hmm. I've never uh, scanned anything quite like that, no. So this is a first. Let's go ahead. Let's right. do it. OK, okay. boss. Take her away. OK. trying to come right across the design, and, okay. you know, to show it and get it all in one plane because the surface of the rock is slightly rounded. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. that's the design. Wow. We're essentially flying through it. Right. Right. Or a star up there. What's going yeah, on right, right here. here? See that? Yeah. Wow, there's a star. It's a ganglion, actually. That's the nerves of the rock. What we see here on the screen is the inside of the rock, and it appears almost entirely white, which means it's very dense throughout. We see a gray line indicating less density where the fracture is, but overall, this thing is pretty solid. Now, if this rock was carved by some process other than sandblasting, we still can't figure out what it was. And who would choose such a hard rock to cut into? We're looking right down the long axis of the rock, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and there's the design. Right. And we're looking to see if there's any density behind that as if it were a pleat onto the surface, uh -huh. which we don't see. So it now we're, like we're paging through. The design through, is scrolling exactly through the same material it as does. the rock itself. It, it you does. You don't see any discontinuity between I, the I do not see any. So I'd like to go back to like at right angles, reason being this question that we had, oh, is there anything inside the rock that might be responsible for the magnetic properties that it has? And nothing is present. And nothing. It, it, we don't see any density in there. But we don't see some clear-cut object inside that rock exactly. to account for the magnetism or anything else. The great thing is that we now know that there is nothing inside the Roswell rock because some people have suggested that well, there's an insert of magnet inside or something like this, but clearly there is nothing inside of it. it and that is what I was curious about. Yeah. I think this is all incredibly fascinating. Yeah, me too. It's great. After conducting the final test on the Roswell Rock, I met up with Robert one last time to get his thoughts on everything we discovered this week. There you are. Hey, good to see you again. Yeah. How are you? Fine. All right. Wow. Wow. What a week, huh? Man, before I tell you what I think, I want you to tell me what do you think? How do you feel? I'm just thrilled that everything we've done is, is shored up and validated what I've always felt about the rock. Great. So, uh, do you have the rock here? Yeah. I happen to have the rock here. Well, he kind of travels with you all the time. Uh -huh. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. If you want anything else, just let me know. You got it. Sweet. There it is. This part right here, you can forever tell people, well, this is where they did testing. This is where they ground into right. the rock. Sure. But I know that there were some pretty emotional moments, to say the least. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's... Um... It hurt to take it from the original state that I found it in, you know. That was a deep point where I was still on the fence, and then we drilled into it. We determined right there and then that it's not a plaster piece, it's not painted, and then the, the CT scan. And, of course, also looking at this under great magnification. Wasn't that cool? Wasn't that just too cool? Yes. <laughs> I mean... That, well, that blew my mind when, that, when we saw that. Especially when I saw the incision marks 
under high magnification. It's as if this was a soft piece of butter that eventually hardened. And I have seen these type of surfaces before in other places around the world where sophisticated tools were used. I didn't see that. I think that we have an artifact here that might potentially be ancient. And so maybe this piece wasn't left behind after the crash, but that this is what they were looking for. A key. Who knows? It might truly be of extraterrestrial origin. Now, that is pure speculation, but that does not prohibit me from asking questions. Sure. And we all know if those questions are uncomfortable, and I always ask the uncomfortable questions, <laughs> so be it. I don't yeah. care. Right. So this has been nothing short of amazing. And so before I leave, I wanted to give you one of these. It is oh, wow. The ancient pre-Columbian gold flyer. And I know this. I, 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 I know this. I'm glad. I know this very well. So you are now this part so of the cool. club. Well, thank you. Thank and, you so uh, much. You know, I hope that this won't be the last time that we, we see each other. So I hope not. Thank either. you very much. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. Yep. Take these with sure, me. Glad to have you. And uh, you know, give me a call. Yeah, Do I have your number. So anything no, new about this, for sure. You got it. All right, Robert. Thank you, Georgio. Thank you very much. Have a safe right. trip. Take care. So now when I connect the dots, what do I think that the Roswell Rock actually is? Well, perhaps it was supposed to be found back in 1947, but when it wasn't, the crop circle was made maybe as a second attempt to give us the message. And what is the message? Maybe it's a type of star calendar letting us know that they're out there and that they plan to return one day. Let's face it, the final chapter of this book has not yet been written. But in the meantime, I'm off once again in search of aliens. I'm on my way to Washington State's Olympic Peninsula, which is one of the world's most active areas for Bigfoot sightings. According to the ancient astronaut theory, extraterrestrials came to Earth in the remote past and modified our DNA to make us what we are today. There are depictions throughout the ancient world of strange hybrid beings like some of the gods in ancient Egypt and the chimera in Greece. And there are also numerous stories of giants and hairy wild men. So could alien visitors have done other genetic experiments? Ones that resulted in a race of beasts that have survived virtually undetected for thousands of years? Or could there be another and even more incredible connection? I'm on a mission to find out if Bigfoot really exists, and if it isn't just a giant hairy beast, but living proof that extraterrestrials not only were here, but maybe they are still living in our midst. My name is Giorgio Tsoukalos. I explore the world that exists between reality and speculation, the known and the unknown. What we've been taught by mainstream scholars is not the whole picture. But I'm convinced that every day we are one step closer to the truth. In 1958, a bulldozer operator in Bluff Creek, California, discovered 16-inch human-like footprints near his equipment. When he told his story to a local newspaper, he said that the footprints must have been made by an animal with a really big foot, and the legend of Bigfoot was born. But tales of mysterious hairy beasts can be found in cultures throughout the world, dating back to ancient times. In the Himalayas, they have stories of the Yeti or the abominable snowman, in Australia, they talk of a giant ape man known as Yowie. In Mongolia, they have the Yaren. 
And although the stories come from different parts of the world, the accounts are surprisingly similar. Most describe a tall, massive creature walking on two legs and looking very much like some sort of a giant ape. But nowhere are the stories more prolific than in America's Pacific Northwest, where thousands of people claim to have seen or encountered the mysterious Bigfoot. I'm about to see the people of the Olympic Project. They are Bigfoot researchers, and apparently they have all sorts of scientific equipment, and they have dedicated their lives to investigating the mystery of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the big hairy monster. This is in the middle of nowhere, and it is God's country. It is absolutely gorgeous. By the way, I have no idea what to expect. All right. This has to be the place. Gentlemen. Hey. hey, how you doing? Look, I found him. He's right there. You can stop your search. I mean, <laughs> what are you guys doing? Game over. Right here. <laughs> yeah, right? How long have you been doing this, and what are you doing? I mean, this is, uh, I love the pots and pans. <laughs> the Olympic Project's about six years old. And it's pretty much, it started out as a comprehensive camera trap program where we would camera trap predatory travel routes. We're basically taking this core area right here and we're documenting every single thing that happens in hopes of getting pictures of Sasquatch. The team of two dozen researchers includes experts in everything from wildlife habitats to high-tech audio and video recording. To date, the group has spent thousands of hours monitoring the Olympic forest looking for evidence of Bigfoot. Leading the team is longtime Bigfoot researcher Derek Randalls. He has invited both myself and Dr. Jeff Meldrum, a professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University, to join the team on an overnight expedition on the Olympic Peninsula. I explore the ancient mysteries of the world, and so the whole idea of Bigfoot to me is interesting because all throughout history, there are bizarre stories of these half-man, half-beast creatures that are found not just in this part of the world, but all around the globe. Given my background, I'm always a little more reticent. I'm a little more critical initially, so I'm down here, and then as I investigate things and, and ask for the questions and look for correlations and corroborations, then that level of acceptance may increase. What can you tell me about the area, and you know, are there any local legends that uh, talk about this uh, amazing creature here? The Olympic Mountain Range has been, for many years, a, a serious hotspot in Bigfoot activity. Curiously, the Olympic Mountain Range is also a hotspot for UFO activity. Over the years, there have been hundreds of reported sightings of strange objects appearing and then quickly disappearing in the sky. In June 2011, two people even claimed they witnessed a cigar-shaped object hovering in the sky for nearly 15 minutes. There have also been reports of people who saw strange lights following a Bigfoot encounter. And there are even some reports of Bigfoot being seen coming out of a disc-shaped craft. I started actually investigating the Olympic Mountain Range in 1985 when I had my own encounter and it, it forever changed my life. You had your own encounter, mm -hmm. so you've seen yes. Bigfoot. Yes. Back in the early 80s, I would get together with a couple hiking partners of mine and we would go up on the trail system. There's a very elaborate trail system throughout the Olympic National Park. So at that time, we started to take our backpacks off and pull our tents out and ready to get situated for the evening. And we heard a very loud crash. And here comes a rock, and it's arcing and it comes down and lands about 10 feet to the left of us. And we didn't even say anything, we didn't even move, we just stood there. And then another one, boom, and it landed about 10 feet to the left of us. And then we panicked. And we just started gathering our stuff up off the ground and then another rock hit. Didn't even take the time to put our backpacks on. We just grabbed them up and started running down the ridge. And I just happened to look back before I turned around. And there it was. It kind of stepped out of the timber line and there was no mistaking of what it was.
my world just came to a screeching halt right there. Right. And the next day, pretty much, I went into Bigfoot research, and I've been doing it ever since. Derek's account seemed very genuine, but then I have to ask myself, with all these Bigfoot encounters, why do we still not have concrete evidence of the creature's existence? Perhaps the Olympic project will be able to find that evidence during our expedition. So what are we looking at here? It's very colorful. What we're looking at is a spectrogram mm -hmm. of an audio file. What I like to do is set up a recorder in an area that has promise and record all night long and then review the audio file to see if I can find anything of interest. Okay. What I've got here is an isolated signature within a, a loop of five different vocalizations that are suspicious. Those lines, are those the vocalizations? They are. Okay. So now this is just a loop of this specific vocal. It's like a guy yodeling. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yes, we can't say specifically that it's a Sasquatch, but that's what interests people that are analyzing the audio. What do you say to someone that might suggest, well, what we just heard is nothing else but a wolf howling? Uh, it's possible, but since we're looking at it in a spectrogram, we can compare it to a wolf spectrogram. David Ellis has collected dozens of animal sounds recorded in the Olympic forest. And each new sound collected is compared to documented animal sounds by using spectrogram analysis. With it, he can eliminate sounds that match with known animals. For example, a wolf howl. According to Ellis, the sound we are listening to now does not match up with anything else on record. That is very interesting. The team arms themselves for the hunt with an arsenal of super sophisticated equipment. Their so-called secret weapon is the FLIR camera, which stands for forward-looking infrared. Often used by law enforcement and the military, FLIR is the top of the line in thermal heat sensing technology. They also bring along an audio dish for amplifying sounds coming out of the forest and motion detector still cameras, all in an effort to find concrete evidence of the legendary creature known as Bigfoot. All of this is great, but as you all know, the real research takes place out in the field. So I would love to take all these gadgets and all our gear out in the open and let's see what happens. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. I'm in Washington State's Olympic Peninsula, about to set out into the forest with the Olympic project. I'm here to find out if Bigfoot actually exists, and if so, could there be an extraterrestrial connection? So Derek, where are we headed right now? We're gonna actually go up on this, this bench up here on the side of Mueller. The team often conducts their Bigfoot expeditions at Mount Mueller, where numerous sightings have been reported. So we're doing this on foot, not with a helicopter. Not on foot. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Is this beautiful through here? The scenery is absolutely beyond anything I've ever seen. This area, there are apparently over 200 reports of sightings by different people. And whenever I hear stuff like that, I'm interested because, you know, you can't suggest that all these 200 reports are from crazy people. So what if something really is going on here? And so I'm very excited to be out here and maybe we'll get some clues to explore this mystery even further. Ready for a break? Let's just take a break here. On every expedition he goes on, Dr. Meldrum carries footprint cast samples with him for comparison in the event they find a fresh one. And many have recently been discovered in this particular forest. So, Dr. Meldrum, you know, you have to tell me, to you, what is the most compelling reasons that you think that Bigfoot might be real? Well, from my point of view, 
it's the footprint evidence. I mean, clearly that's my area of expertise, and so it, it has the greatest significance to me. Let me show you a couple of examples here. Oh, wow, you brought a cast. I did, a couple, nice. a pair of them, in fact. You'll hold that one for a second. Oh, wow, these are amazing. Now, these are some good examples of, of some, some very classic Sasquatch tracks. Uh, this is probably a large male. It measures between 16 and 17 inches in length. And it's quite broad, you know, nearly seven inches across the forefoot here. And in contrast, the female, this one which measures between about 14 and 15 inches, maybe five inches across the forefoot here. And so, I mean, clearly these are not just simply uh, someone with a big foot walking around barefoot. Check this out. Wow. Dr. Meldrum has over 200 examples of footprint casts that indicate that the anatomy of the creature could be similar to that of a large bipedal ape. With a foot measuring some 16 inches in length, it would stand somewhere between 8 and 10 feet tall and would weigh in excess of 1,000 pounds. But rather than an arched foot, as in the case of humans, the creature's footprints indicate that its weight is distributed much more evenly, giving it flat but still very flexible feet. So, Dr. Meldrum, you're of the conviction mm -hmm. that these prints are real. I am. I am. Some unknown creature has been leaving these footprints. After hiking for several hours, the team sets up camp. Everyone works together to get organized quickly before the light fades. Then we head out into the woods with thermal cameras and audio equipment to search for Bigfoot. So this is what we're gonna be using. How long do you leave a camera out like this? Batteries usually last for three to six months, depending on how many pictures they're taking. And it only picks up when there's movement. Movement, for okay, sure. Okay, okay. All right, so now we've set up the infrared camera. Looks good. Let's go back. In addition to the motion control cameras, David Ellis places audio recording equipment near game trails to capture any unusual vocalizations. This is a parabolic dish and it is designed to amplify sound from a specific direction. And usually I'll have somebody off in the distance and we'll do sound checks. So I get an idea of how close something is to the dish. So would you be uh, so kind as to do a sound check for me? Are you saying you want me to be Bigfoot? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Fine, I'll do it. Okay, so just thanks. into the distance right here, all right. That's probably far enough. All right. Now give me a whisper. Can you hear me? Perfect. So you could hear me whisper from I can. 75 yes. feet away. I mean, it clears a bell, right? Yes, so I'm good. All right. In the end, all of this is about the unknown. Derek Randalls is one of the founders of the Olympic Project. I wanted to spend some time with him and tap into his expertise about what he thinks this creature is and is not. So, in your opinion, why do you think Bigfoot is so elusive? I think that there's very few. They're very few, they're very smart, uh, they're expert woodsmen. To just go out and find a Sasquatch, you're gonna win the lottery first. They are far and away our superior out here in the woods. I find it interesting that every member of the Olympic project talks about Bigfoot as being this very large, but also intelligent creature. When I hear this, I'm reminded of the story of the Watchers from the Book of Enoch. This apocryphal text, which was edited out of the traditional Christian Bible, tells of a group of angels called the Watchers who descended to Earth from heaven shortly after the time of creation. According to the Book of Enoch, the Watchers mated with early humans and bred a race of giants called the Nephilim. Might otherworldly visitors have come here and engaged in some sort of genetic manipulation? And could one of these genetic experiments still be living among us right here on Earth? 
I want to talk to you about sound. I mean, I've also been told that people clap in order to make their presence known, and then there is a, a return clap or something like this. What's that all about? You're probably referring to wood knocks. OK. We do wood knocks to try to solicit a response. I've actually got a knocker if you want to. Oh, is that, is that that thing yeah. right here? All right. I can show you what I'm talking okay. about. OK. And here I thought you were a barkeep. <laughs> all right. So normally, we just try to find a tree like this that's not too thick because then the sound will carry better. So this is kind of perfect right here, but I'll show you what I'm talking about. And then generally after you do that, you just listen to see if there's going to be a return knock. And believe it or not, it does happen. You want to try it? Of course, yes, absolutely. Maybe something will happen. <laughs> Great. Can I keep this while we walk through the woods? Keep it. I need protection. <laughs> the modern day phenomenon of Bigfoot isn't something that has just sprung up recently, but there are in fact legends from ancient times from all around the world. For example, in the remains of the ancient city of Nineveh in what is present day Iraq. Sumerian tablets dating as far back as 1800 BC tell the story of King Gilgamesh and his companion named Enkidu. Enkidu is described as a large, hairy wild man living outside human society. But the most fascinating part of the story is that Enkidu was supposedly created by powerful beings called the Anunnaki, which, when translated, means those who from the heavens came. So could the story of the Anunnaki and Enkidu be connected to the similar stories about the Watchers in the Book of Enoch? And if Bigfoot really exists, could it be the product of extraterrestrial engineering? Let's go find Bigfoot. Let's do it. As the light fades, James and I set off with the mobile FLIR camera to look for any signs of Bigfoot. So James, is this what you do? You drive around all night with the, with the machine on and, and you scope a 360 degree view? Absolutely, we'll go find a place that's got great visual and, and we'll set up and, and sit there and watch for a while or we'll, we'll just keep following the roads and see what we see. Pretty impressive technology. I mean, this looks pretty cool. I mean, it's a thermal camera, and we will see things that are emitting heat. And so, you know, we can point the camera all the way to the sky, potentially see some UFOs, who knows? Suddenly, something appears on the monitor. Look, look, what's this over here? Where are you pointing? I mean, this thing is, it's glowing. Some kind of body part. In the fading light, all we can see are trees, but the thermal camera has hit on something which appears to be a warm-blooded animal. I'm gonna actually see if yeah. we can make it move. And now he's moving. See its head? Can you see it? Oh, wow. Its head's down right now. Whoa. That's the deer. I've been a hunter for years, and I cannot pick that deer out of the brush right there. This technology is quite amazing. In 1980, investigative journalist Linda Moulton Howe discovered a connection between Bigfoot and the unexplained phenomenon of animal mutilations. Linda had received a letter from a man in Snohomish, Washington, just 90 miles from where we are now. He reported seeing a silver disc in the sky that shot a beam of light down to the earth. In the beam of light, he saw what he described as a tall, shaggy creature which walked off into the woods as the craft disappeared. Over the next few days, there were reports in the area of livestock found dead with missing organs and body parts. 
but all looked as if they had been removed with surgical precision. If a connection can be made between Bigfoot and these strange animal mutilations, I think it's safe to suggest that we may very well be dealing with something of an extraterrestrial origin. Dr. Meldrum, mm -hmm. there's one personal question that I would like to ask you, and that is, have you ever had an encounter? Well, I've had a variety of experiences, uh, ranging from, you know, vocalizations, bumps in the night, uh, finding footprints on a number of occasions. I've even seen a fleeting silhouette that could very well have been a Sasquatch. But I'm still waiting for that vivid, conclusive, uh, definitive encounter in broad daylight. And you know, all of this stuff today, it really got me thinking in correlation to the ancient stories that I'm familiar with of these hairy beasts in ancient times that are described all around the world in different cultures. So what if what we have here is something rather similar? The investigations have to continue, but I'm tired. And so tomorrow is another day and I'm gonna turn off the lights and go to sleep. The next day, Dr. Meldrum and the Olympic project team informed me that they had decided to continue their expedition for two more days. But unfortunately, I needed to move on. Uh, that way, right? Yes, yes. straight back. <laughs> Before I leave the Pacific Northwest, I'd like to meet up with Richard Germo, a former police officer. He claims to have seen Bigfoot not once, but twice. So I'm really stoked to hear his take on the whole Bigfoot phenomenon. I've been told that you've actually had an encounter with Bigfoot twice. I mean, that's like hitting the lottery. So tell me more about this. Well, <clears throat> I did have a, an encounter back in 2000. I was a police officer in La Push, Washington at that time. And La Push is an Indian reservation on the coast. Many Native American cultures share traditional ancient legends which refer to large, hair-covered man beasts whom they believe inhabit the deep woods of the Pacific Northwest. Even today, the Quinault Indians of the Olympic Peninsula report sightings of a huge ape-like hominid they call Tsiatko. In fact, the existence of these tall, shaggy creatures, also known as Sasquatch, is simply taken for granted by many Native American tribes. I was driving down the road and it was about seven or eight in the evening, but it was still plenty of light. And I was coming around this corner and the beach was off to my left and um, just this dark figure that was really tall and big. Stepped out of the brush on one side onto the roadway and it commenced to take about four steps before it cleared the road and it went into the brush and just kept going. So from what you saw during that first encounter, how big was that creature? The chest to the back looked massive. I mean, I don't know how deep it was, but it was thick. And um, I was only about a mile and a half away from my office that I worked in at that point. So I drove right there, and at that time, there was a, a deputy from the county sheriff's office that was there and two of my coworkers, and I told them what happened right away. Wow. And uh, they ridiculed me and laughed at me like people normally would. Richard's experience affected him so strongly that despite the ridicule he received from his colleagues in the police department, he went on to co-found the Olympic project with Derek Randalls. In 2010, Richard set up a number of motion control cameras in an area believed to be a Bigfoot lair. I had a really bad feeling even when I got there. Everything was really quiet and it was kind of drizzly. It was just an eerie day. So I hear twigs break, but there's nothing over there. Not more than a few seconds after that, I hear a, like an exhale. And um, I started to look up, and I could see something was standing about 20 yards in front of me. And then, in one motion, it was shot through this opening. I said, if I don't leave now, I'm gonna die. So I turned and I ran the other way. It was really close, and it was huge. And um, 
I'm a little shaken up of it just right now talking about it. You were shaking just recounting the story. Mm -hmm. It was a traumatic event. Although legends concerning large hairy creatures have been told and retold for centuries, what turned Bigfoot into a household name was the notorious Patterson-Gimlin film. Even though some have judged the footage as a hoax, there are many who believe that it offers convincing evidence that Bigfoot really does exist. So what do you think that creature actually is? In the beginning, when I got into it, I kind of looked at it as it must be a relic hominid of some type, you know, North American ape. And that certainly is a possibility. Um, but when you look at the Native American history, that's much more supernatural even to some aspects of a shapeshifter, interdimensional type being. A shapeshifter? An interdimensional being? Now when I hear things like that, my mind goes to stories of shape-shifting beings that appear in many ancient cultures, including the Greek tale of Zeus, who transformed King Lycaon into a wolf. Many Native American myths include legends of creatures known as skinwalkers, humans who can change their shape at will and often take the form of large hairy beasts. Um, I, I'm not saying that I necessarily believe along those lines. Um, but those stories exist. They do exist mm -hmm. and there must be a reason for it. That's a, a verbal history of those people. And uh, all tribes tend to have the same type of stories about these beings. Well, Rich, thank you very much for allowing me to come out here and to hear your stories. The second encounter, the way you describe that, that will haunt me for the rest of my life. After hearing Rich Germo's incredible first-hand account, I've decided to reach out to my good friend, Dr. Jonathan Young, an expert in mythology and the founding curator of the Joseph Campbell Archives. So thanks very much for, for seeing me on such short notice, but I recently met this former detective, Rich Germo, and he thinks that Bigfoot, or whatever it is he saw, was some sort of a shapeshifter or a oh, skinwalker. Wow. Yeah. And so I know that that is right up your alley. Whatever is happening, it's significant. So we have Yeti in the Himalaya areas, we have giants in Africa, we have all the reports in the Pacific Northwest, which have been the Bigfoot sightings. The fact that they keep happening suggests that there's something to it. I want to show you some things. Hey, come, come with me. All right. I was thinking, Giorgio, about this wild man image, how it shows up in some really popular forms. A very familiar form from Western culture is Merlin. Merlin, he's a shamanistic magician. He lives in a cave. So you've got the cave diver tradition there, This, the troglodytes, all the way back to the Greek historians. Now, this is a truly fascinating connection to me because many historians believe that the wizard Merlin is actually based on a legendary Welsh figure named Merdin Wilt, who is described as a hairy madman who wandered in the company of beasts. Now, in the ancient Greek myths, the troglodytes are these large, hairy, beastly-looking creatures that lived underground and could be extremely terrifying. But they were also depicted as being very wise, and according to the ancient legends, the troglodytes descended from the sky and were hiding out in caves and tunnels because they wanted to keep their presence a secret. There have been stories about magical animals and humans turning into animals, animals turning into humans from, well, pretty much as long as we've had recorded history. So take the werewolf. Those characters transcend our moral code. They do what they want. They are like beasts in that regard. And then they become people again. Is the Bigfoot a shapeshifter? Is it something else part of the time? Is that why we don't see it all the time? Man, the idea that Bigfoot could be some sort of a shapeshifter, like a werewolf, is incredible. Because if true, it could explain why Bigfoot has been so elusive. It is able to hide among us in human form. 
I've always been fascinated by the idea of the hybrids, these half-man, half-animal creatures that permeate all of history. In your opinion, what, what are we looking at there? Yeah, it's, it's just very, very interesting the way they show up in so many variations. I've got an image here of a half-horse, half-man. It's very close to the image of Pan. Mm -hmm. And it is very powerful crossing between the known and the unknown. All around the world, we can find carvings or statues of what are called hybrid beings. In India, we have the Naga, which is a half-man, half-snake. In Greece, there is the Medusa, who has snakes for hair. And in Egypt, there is an entire god pantheon of half-man, half-animal deities, like Anubis, a creature that has the head of a jackal and the body of a human being. Various hybrid images that show up from time to time all through history and a recent present-day manifestation is Bigfoot. Yeti. Do they have the kind of impact that these hybrid gods had? Are they showing us the way to something metaphysical, something transcendent? That's what gets me excited about these sightings. Life is strange, and there's a lot to know that we do not know. And it's important to study the margins, to study the things that we don't understand yet. Bigfoot and I will cross paths. Jonathan, this was great. Thank you very much for your time. I've learned a lot. Now, we know that scientists are always discovering new organisms all the time. So it isn't so hard for me to believe or speculate that there really could be a creature, even one as large as Bigfoot, that has so far evaded detection or even capture. But the big difference between believing something and knowing it is the difference between faith and science. And because scientists are the hardest people to convince, I've made a trip to the Museum of Man in San Diego to ask biological anthropologist Dr. Tori Randall if she thinks that a creature like Bigfoot could actually be real. One of the main attractions here is a model of Lucy, a hominid whose skeleton was discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. It is considered by scientists to be what many have claimed Bigfoot could be, a missing link between apes and humans. All right, there she is. This is Lucy, she's an Australopithecus afarensis, mm -hmm. um, an early hominin that lived about two to four million years ago. She stood about three and a half feet tall, and she has some ape-like and some more human-like traits. She's bipedal, which is one of the things that we attribute to humans. Right. Although Lucy is far too small to suggest that she may have a direct connection to Bigfoot, there were, in fact, a number of very large primates that walked the Earth as far back as 100,000 years ago. One of these, known as Gigantopithecus, stood an incredible 10 to 12 feet tall. And if Bigfoot really exists, could it be a direct descendant of this giant prehistoric creature? Who are these two friends right here? So, we have a couple of um, reconstructions of different hominins here. This one is an Australopithecine, which is an earlier form of hominin, um, probably about two to four million years ago. This one is a Homo habilis, which is the first member of the Homo genus, which is what we are as Homo sapiens. Um, so a little bit more modern if you're comparing these two. So Tori, in your opinion, do you think it is at all possible that a subspecies, for example, Bigfoot, could exist under the radar and it hasn't yet been discovered? Is such a thing possible? Having a subspecies that's existing in isolation somewhere, that definitely is possible. This has been an incredible opportunity to explore something that I've been interested in for a long time, the development of animals and humans on our planet. 
Did we descend from apes over millions of years, or was there some extraterrestrial intervention? It raises many questions involving science and the unknown. But what I find myself blown away by is that a biological anthropologist like Dr. Tori Randall believes it's possible that a large, hairy creature like Bigfoot could, in fact, exist. If one were to subscribe to the idea that a species like Bigfoot exists, what would have to have occurred for such a thing to even happen? An organism can be isolated. There can be interbreeding where two different populations can come together and a brand new trait will show up. Or there can be a mutation where there's a brand new random trait that no one's ever seen in that organism before. Dr. Randall's notion that Bigfoot may possibly exist, but also may have been able to escape capture due to centuries of evolution is really interesting to me. Perhaps centuries ago, they were hunted by early man, but by now, only the smartest and most elusive ones have survived. So what are the primary gene differences between apes and humans? Our DNA in general is very similar. We share 99.8% of our DNA with a chimpanzee, but there are particular genes that distinguish humans from other apes. For instance, the DUF1220 gene, Scientists have discovered that a protein called DUF1220 may in fact be the so-called missing link in human brain evolution. Six million years ago, as humans began to diverge from the ape family, there was also a noticeable increase in DUF1220. If we're talking about brain size, modern humans have the cranial capacity about 1,200 to 1,300 cubic centimeters. In this gorilla, it's about 400 to 450. And the same thing in this Australopithecine is about 400 to 450. So this is you know, one of our earliest ancestors. And they had a brain size about the size of a modern day ape. This is really interesting because not even scientists can sufficiently explain why early humans suddenly featured an increase in genetic coding such as DUF1220, which is part of the so-called secret sauce that makes us who we are today. Now, was it simply evolution, a random mutation, or was it extraterrestrial intervention? Some people have proposed that Bigfoot might be the missing link between humans and apes. What do you think about that? People find a brand new species that's alive all the time, that, you know, something in the rainforest that no one's ever seen before and someone comes across it. So I certainly would be open to the possibility that a fossil is going to be found that we've never seen before. And to hear you say this is very exciting to me that, you know, to me, science is always to be open-minded and not to be closed off to the possibility of asking a question, what if? And so to thank you for your time, I wanted to give you this right here as a token of my appreciation, which is an ancient pre-Columbian funerary object that has been found in multiple tombs. And uh, keep me up to date. If anything new happens in the development of finding the various missing links, I would like to hear from you. I will. I will. Thank, Thank you so much, you Tori. Much. Until next time. Bye-bye. After connecting all the dots, I'm more and more convinced that if Bigfoot exists, it isn't likely the product of extraterrestrial gene manipulation because we are. In fact, what if Bigfoot is what humans would be if aliens had not intervened on this planet? Possibly the last survivors of mankind's genetic ancestors before we received the so-called secret sauce that made us the creatures we are today. Before we shed our fur for hair or learn to speak and before some of us began traveling the world in search of aliens. I'm in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and 
everywhere I look, I'm reminded of the ancient world. There are Greek pillars, a giant stupa-shaped dome, and even a huge Egyptian-style obelisk. But it's not just the architecture that was inspired by civilizations that thrived thousands of years ago. Many of America's founding fathers, including Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and George Washington, were steeped in ancient knowledge and even believed that intelligent life existed throughout the universe. But was this belief based on logical speculation or was it based on something more? I'm on a mission to find out if there might be more to this country's origins than what we've been told by mainstream scholars and to see if there are any real connections between extraterrestrials and the founding of America. My name is Giorgio Tsoukalos. I explore the world that exists between reality and speculation, the known and the unknown. What we've been taught by mainstream scholars is not the whole picture. But I'm convinced that every day we are one step closer to the truth. On July 19, 1952, during the height of the Cold War, an air traffic controller at Washington National Airport picked up seven unidentified flying objects on his radar screen approaching our nation's capital. He initially feared that they were Soviet military, but quickly determined otherwise based on their strange movement. Witnesses in the airport tower reported seeing large bright lights moving quickly across the sky, some speeding away and others simply disappearing. These lights were reported to be seen over the Capitol building, the White House and the Washington Monument. Fighter jets were deployed to intercept the objects, but as they closed in, the mysterious lights suddenly disappeared. Several days after this event, Major General John Samford, Director of Intelligence for the United States Air Force, addressed the issue at a Pentagon press conference. We have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. But what were these strange lights? Could they have been some sort of alien spacecraft? And if so, what were they doing in Washington, D.C.? Some have suggested that since ancient times, extraterrestrials have monitored human progress and may have even played a role in influencing human history. So is it possible that they have been watching over the United States of America and even guiding its progress since the nation's very beginnings? I'm in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., to meet with historian Richard Dolan, an expert on the history of extraterrestrial contact and UFO events in the United States. With his help, I hope to find out if there's a history of documented contact right here in Washington and possibly dating back to the founding fathers. Richard has studied not only early American history, but he's authored several books on the hidden history of UFO contact and its influence upon our government. America, or the United States, was supposed to be this place of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, Absolutely. all these things that were censored and looked down upon in the old country. So in your view of history, has a country ever existed that was based on the principles of the United States with the tenets of freedom of speech and religion and the pursuit of happiness. That's the, the beautiful thing about the United States, the truly beautiful thing, is that this was the place where those principles were first incorporated into the very foundation of the society. That's what we talk about when we made the American dream. This is a place where you had freedom of speech, freedom to be yourself. 
America was always considered the new world. When Columbus got here, it was the new world. And back in the days of Washington, they were very aware of that. And when they were creating that republic, they consciously were trying to create a new and better world, one based on principles of freedom. The discovery of America really was like the discovery of a new world because when Christopher Columbus sailed westward from Spain across the Atlantic Ocean, there were those who thought that he would either reach Asia or he would fall off the edge of the earth. They had no idea that America even existed. On the night of October 11th, 1492, just days before he reached land, Columbus wrote in his log that from the deck of the Santa Maria he saw, and I quote, a light glimmering at a great distance and appeared like the light of a wax candle moving up and down. Now, they were too far out to see for this to have been a light from shore. So what could it have been? Some kind of an extraterrestrial beacon? A sign that Columbus and his companions were being welcomed? But if so, by whom? Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, James Madison, all of these thinkers and more were enamored of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. And they were very self-consciously trying to bring back those traditions. That's why we have this institution called the Senate that comes out of ancient Rome. That's why all the architecture is based on classical models, the classical pillars and the, the domes and all of this. This is all right out of classical I, And I think it's a great homage to uh, the, the great free thinkers of the ancient world because you wouldn't create these uh, structures unless it were to honor where this whole knowledge and these ideas originated. For sure. Shortly after the start of the American Revolutionary War, on July 4th, 1776, the 13 colonies formally severed their ties to England, both politically and philosophically. It is well documented that many of the men whom we call the Founding Fathers fully embraced the Age of Enlightenment, a social movement that valued science over superstition, and individual human rights over what they considered the tyranny of the European monarchies. A big part of this philosophy was a concept dating back to the 5th century BC called the plurality of worlds, the belief that life exists not only on Earth, but throughout the entire universe. One of the questions I'm dying to ask you is that there are these rumors that have circulated that at some point George Washington apparently made contact with these green-skinned people. Is there any truth to that? Because I find it incredible. I, I did look into this. I, I feel that there's no justification for this whatsoever. But here's the interesting thing about Washington. Um, there were many stories or myths about him during the days of Valley Forge, which was a really horrible, difficult, dark time for, for Washington and the Continental Army. And many of these men starved and froze to death that winter. It was, it was horrific. And during that time, Washington would go out to pray, trying to get guidance, spiritual guidance. And he had some kind of mystical encounter. He supposedly was met by this woman who called him son of the Republic. According to one of the accounts, a strange so-called woman in white informed Washington of the victory that the Continental Army would have against the British. She presented him with a vision of the new United States of America. General Washington was even shown a map of the United States, and as raindrops fell onto this map, cities began to appear, popping up throughout the entire country. It was a model of what the United States would look like in the future. So that is very interesting to me because the idea or the legends of cosmic mothers are prevalent throughout ancient history. And it supposedly surfaced from uh, one of the survivors of Valley Forge. 
you get a number of these myths, uh, uh, stories about Washington having some kind of mystical encounter at Valley Forge. Could it be true? Sure, it could be true. I'm about to meet with Grand Master Akram Elias, a longtime Freemason in Washington, D.C. And I want to find out about Freemasonry's influence on some of our founding fathers, such as Washington and Jefferson, and to see how Freemasonry may have impacted the birth of our nation. Oh, this is amazing. So, Grandmaster Elias, where are we? What is this particular oh, please, room right please here? Please call me Akram first. I will, uh, thank thanks, you. Thanks. <laughs> Well, we are here in the uh, Masonic Lodge Room of the Scottish Rite in Washington, D.C. Architecture, uh, in short, is very important uh, in, in masonry, and that is uh, one of the reasons why uh, the supreme being uh, is referred to as the grand architect uh, of the universe by Freemasons. Now, the letter G, quite often people think it's related to God. Uh, in fact, the letter G is the initial of the word geometry. And the idea, again, of the grand architect of the universe is the grand geometrician. It doesn't matter what religion they come from, but the word architect brings reason, design, and beauty uh, together. And the origins really go back to the uh, Renaissance period which is the time when scientific discovery, the explosion in art, and Renaissance going back to some of the ancients, the Greeks and the Romans. What was the lost knowledge? How can we bring it back? This is incredibly fascinating to me because these are essentially the original tenets of the United States. And so with the idea that, you know, George Washington was a Mason, you know, people have forgotten that uh, in the end it is all connected. Uh, absolutely. I may even go further by saying it was the, a lot of the Masonic ideals and principles uh, that inspired um, the Founding Fathers and helped the founding uh, of this nation. According to historians, nine signers of the Declaration of Independence and 13 signers of the Constitution were Freemasons. And Akram told me that Master Mason George Washington was so passionate about the concepts of Freemasonry that on September 18, 1793, he insisted on laying the cornerstone of the Capitol building according to Masonic ceremonial traditions. George Washington, dressed in his full Masonic regalia, led a Masonic parade from the White House to Jenkins Hill, which is now called Capitol Hill, to lay the cornerstone of the US Capitol, the powerful symbol of this new grand experiment, the legislative branch. Was it more acceptable for George Washington to show up in his regalia? Mm -hmm. Would people back in the day scoff at that, or was it something that was accepted in society? No, it was very much accepted. And as a matter of fact, the United States uh, stood out uh, in a way uh, because so many of the founders, uh, founding fathers of the United States were Freemasons and proud to be Freemasons. One of the most fascinating paintings that exists of George Washington is an 1866 lithograph that depicts him in his Masonic regalia. And there is Masonic imagery throughout the painting. Over his right shoulder is the popular Freemason symbol of Jacob's Ladder, which comes from the biblical story where Jacob witnesses angels ascending and descending a ladder from heaven. But in the painting, the ladder doesn't appear to be coming from heaven. It looks to be coming out of a dark, round object emitting multicolored lights. So are we really looking at a ladder from heaven here, or could this be a ramp coming out of some type of craft? And if so, what is it doing in a painting of George Washington? I can get you into some of the additional Masonic symbolism in the city. Uh, the Washington Monument is an extraordinary example of Masonic symbolism in the city. In fact, it was the one thing that triggered my interest, curiosity. Really? He said, what is an obelisk, an Egyptian-style structure, doing here in the middle of 
Washington, D.C. The architect was a Freemason. At 555 feet high, the Washington Monument is the largest obelisk on the planet and harkens back to the ancient world more than any other structure in Washington, D.C. The Freemasons built it so that the constellation of Pleiades would be visible directly over its pyramid-shaped tip. But even more fascinating is the fact that they also installed a reflecting pool, so the observer is given the impression that the monument itself is not only pointing up to the heavens, but is pointing from the heavens down into the earth. This notion represents another concept that the Freemasons adopted from the ancient world, that of as above, so below, meaning the world of the universe is also right here all around us. Then I started looking at the architects, and then I discovered that all the major architects who worked on these major structures were also Freemasons, from the Supreme Court to the United States Capitol, to the White House, to the Lincoln Memorial, and I said, wow. And of course, an architect is an artist, and an artist reflects his or her views, beliefs, whatever it is, in their art. Now, just as interesting to me as the Washington Monument is the dome of the Capitol building. I mean, look at it. It looks exactly like a stupa, a bell-shaped dome that was believed by ancient Buddhists to have mystical powers. Numerous ancient Sanskrit texts describe stupas as chariots of the gods flying machines in which powerful beings came down from the heavens. There are even those who believe that the stupa's design helps people underneath it to connect directly with extraterrestrial knowledge. So I've always been curious about the dollar bill, and since I've got you right here, I wanted to see if there's anything you can explain to me about the symbolism that exists on our dollar bill. This is the most esoteric piece of paper money that exists on the face of the earth. And esoteric means it has hidden symbols that only somebody who has been taught to decipher them can really understand them. So let me start with the pyramid. The pyramid is really connected to the obelisk because both are two great symbols from ancient Egypt, the great builders. Now, below the pyramid, you will see there is a Latin inscription. It says, Novus Ordo Seclorum, which in Latin means new order for the ages. The founders were basically telling us, it is up to you future generations of Americans to keep the building going. And to do that building, you need a source of light. And that's why you see on top of the pyramid an all-seeing eye with light in a triangle. It's an, also a symbol from ancient Egypt. It's mythological. You interpret it any way you want. I mean, there are countless cultures with that exact same idea. The Masonic symbolism on the dollar bill is fascinating, especially the all-seeing eye, because this is an ancient symbol that is sometimes meant to suggest that there is someone or something watching over us. So for men who were promoting science and reason over religious faith, what might this mean? Was the all-seeing eye meant to allude to the Almighty God? Or could it be that the Founding Fathers believed that there was some other, perhaps, some kind of extraterrestrial presence guiding their way? A presence that may have had a vested interest in the American experiment. I'm talking with Grand Master Akram Elias, a longtime Freemason in Washington, D.C., who has been pointing out to me just how abundant Masonic symbolism is in America's capital. But what really caught my interest is the fact that the symbolism doesn't end with the architecture. There are symbols built right into the layout of the city itself. Since Washington, D.C. was designed on a map, what makes it unique is that it had to be designed with the intent that it should reflect a philosophy of government. Right and geometry. So if you look at Washington, D.C., everything is geometrically shaped. The Capitol is at the center. The district's divided into four quadrants, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. Very scientific. So now, when you look at the city from above, 
you're going to see the intersection between avenues and streets forming, obviously, geometric shapes. Triangles, rectangles, squares. This is to make a very important point. This new form of government will not be based on religion to govern the affairs of the people. It will be based on the scientific method, geometry, reason, and beauty. I must call you Grandmaster Elias, because this has been very, very well, That's very kind of you. To find out more about the design of our nation's capital, I'm heading to Logan Circle in downtown Washington to meet up with Freemason Mark Colco Rivera and local historical surveyor Chaz Langlin. These are some very interesting instruments, and I presume they're quite old. They're wonderful. 1700s, early 1800s no is the, way. the period of time that the, huh. the city of Washington was surveyed. To get a hands-on demonstration of how the Founding Fathers planned and surveyed the city, and with the actual instruments they would have used, was really amazing. This is the angle device transit. This is how they measure distances in colonial times. Can you show us here on the field how some of these things were actually implemented? They didn't have a flexible steel tape. Prior to that, it was this. 33 foot surveyor's chain. Why 33 feet? Exactly, why? 33 feet works into a mile evenly. It works into an acre evenly. You want to try it? Yeah, absolutely. Where do I go? It's interesting that the length of the surveyor's chain is exactly 33 feet. Three is a mystical number in Freemasonry dating back to ancient times. Is it possible that a 33-foot measuring device was chosen once again to keep with Masonic principles, or is this just a coincidence? Plunk it down. Congratulations. You've just measured the first 33 feet of the continental United States. Keep going, then measure it back, and you will do what the surveyors did. It's awesome to think that the entire city of Washington, D.C. was measured to make such a design using nothing but chains. And the effort it clearly took the Founding Fathers to realize their vision got me even more curious about the design they chose and the purpose behind it. Is it possible that the Founding Fathers perhaps intended for it to be recognized from the sky? What do you think somebody might see seeing Washington, D.C. from space? You know, there's been articles that L'Enfant speculated about that. I think they're true. Pierre L'Enfant, right. he was the engineer of the city of Washington, the designer of the city, the planner. And he played with symmetry, which was a brand new revolutionary concept. The eastern 13 colonies are, if you look at them from the air, the lines and the roads and the fields are all cockeyed and cattywampus. It's the old English system. That system came here, we were English colonies. He wanted his plan to be symmetrical. These circles were lined up on high points, but then he played with them. He wanted it, and it's not exactly symmetrical. He wasn't able to get it perfect. Sure. But he played with it. Make this the parallel with that, parallel with that, this, 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 make them parallel. In other words, he could have connected an avenue from here to here, but he didn't because he wanted symmetry. He was concerned about what the plan would look like from the air. This is really fascinating to think that the founding fathers, along with surveyor Pierre L'Enfant, also a Freemason, considered what Washington DC would look like from high above the earth when they came up with their design for the city. In the ancient world, we can find a number of sites purposely designed to be seen from the sky. Most famously, we have the Nazca Lines in Peru. But there's also the Serpent Mound in Ohio, the Kofun Tombs in Japan, the Atacama Giant in Chile, and numerous others. And of course, in the ancient world, the mythology was always that these places were meant to be seen by the gods. So what were the intentions of the Founding Fathers? Could it be that the Founding Fathers, many of whom believed that intelligent life existed elsewhere on other planets, designed Washington DC in the anticipation that America might one day be visited by extraterrestrials? 
Or is it possible that America had already been visited hundreds of years ago? On April 5th, 1800, Vice President Thomas Jefferson received one of America's first official UFO reports. Astronomer William Dunbar in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, reported to Jefferson that he witnessed a bright glowing light the size of a large house hovering 200 yards above the ground. Dunbar said that it was very bright, gave off a lot of heat, and crashed to the earth close by. Jefferson took this report very seriously, so much so that he wrote about it in his diary. He even presented it to the American Philosophical Society. And to this day, Thomas Jefferson, along with former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, remain the most powerful public figures ever to officially acknowledge a UFO encounter. It's incredible to me that Thomas Jefferson reported a UFO sighting and almost no one today knows about it. But one of his contemporaries was even more adamant that we are not alone in the universe. I'm in Philadelphia to learn more about the founding father who was the most outspoken of all concerning his ideas about extraterrestrial life. Benjamin Franklin. To find out why Ben Franklin was such a strong proponent of the notion that life exists beyond Earth, I'm meeting up with author and historian Michael Zuckerman. Michael and I have arranged to meet at Philadelphia's Stenton House, built by James Logan, a friend of Ben Franklin's. So did Ben Franklin frequent this house? Franklin would have come here a lot mm -hmm. because Franklin loved books. And Logan had the most amazing library, for sure in Pennsylvania. Really? Probably in all of early America. And the only library that ever approached it was Ben Franklin's own library, as he built it later on. Even though America's founding fathers included some of the most brilliant men America has ever known, Benjamin Franklin still managed to stand out. He was an inspired genius whose advanced scientific ideas on everything from electricity and light waves to weather patterns and ocean currents place him on par with men like Leonardo da Vinci and Albert Einstein. He contributed to everything. He was the greatest diplomat America ever had, the greatest scientist we ever had. I mean, he was the most important scientist of the 18th century period. And he got honorary degrees from half a dozen universities. He was a great writer. He was obviously an inventor, but he was a civic leader. He was the most powerful politician in Pennsylvania. He was a military man. There was nothing he couldn't do. It's staggering what Benjamin Franklin was able to accomplish with virtually no formal education. As a young man, he refused to attend church, but instead educated himself about all the major religions. He was the antithesis of spiritual. Despite that, he read widely in theology. He wrote more theology than any non-clergyman in all of colonial America. How do you think Franklin has approached the idea of the plurality of worlds? For people of some scientific knowledge in the 18th century, it was a given scientific fact. Franklin said that if you're gonna pray, it's a grand mistake to pray to God because God has to watch over this enormous cosmos. God can't be bothered with this tiny little planet Earth. So Franklin took it as a given that there were many, many other worlds. He imagined serried ranks of angels taking care of different parts of that universe. And, uh, and he just took that as a matter of fact. The concept of the plurality of worlds originated in ancient Greece. But what many people don't know is that the Founding Fathers were also heavily influenced 
by Native American culture and their stories of beings that descended from the stars. It's becoming increasingly clear to me that the concept of life existing beyond Earth had a strong influence on the Founding Fathers, but I'm really curious to discover what they learned from the people who first inhabited America. At this point of my investigation, I'm convinced that America was founded by men and women who were undoubtedly religious, but they were also tolerant of the idea that intelligent life might exist throughout the universe. They also intentionally founded their new nation on the ancient philosophies of Rome, Greece, Egypt, and India, civilizations which, in turn, credited their origins to so-called gods, visitors from the stars who came to Earth and shared their wisdom with mankind. I'm also becoming convinced that another ancient civilization played a significant role in conducting the American experiment, that of the native Iroquois. For this reason, I've traveled to Georgetown in Washington, D.C. to meet with Dr. Donald Grindy, an expert on Iroquois history. How are you? Pleasure to meet you. How are you? I'm interested to hear how the Iroquois Six Nations Treaty may have actually been an inspiration to our very own Constitution. I've heard all these different stories about how the Iroquois played an instrumental part in the creation of our nation. What can you tell me about the Iroquois? Uh, well, the Iroquois uh, are Haudenosaunee people, is what they call themselves, which means people of the Longhouse. And they are basically in New York State and southern Ontario. They're the indigenous people to those areas. What can you tell me about Chief Kanasasego? Who was he and why was he so significant? Well, Kanasasego was a Six Nations Iroquois chief. He spoke at a treaty that Benjamin Franklin was in attendance in 1754. And he told the American colonists that they should think about developing a confederation similar to the Iroquois Confederacy. Did this great law of peace inspire the founding fathers to found this nation on similar laws? Yes, yes. Benjamin Franklin was inspired about the Iroquois, how they govern. It is generally regarded as one of the first steps towards independence. Are there any specific concepts that you're aware of that have made it into our present day government? Well, I mean, there's we the people, which is sovereignty or power resides in the people. Under the monarchical system, sovereignty resided in the king who was appointed by God. And we the people is how the Iroquois constitution starts. It's about the people. I'm excited to see how much the principles and even the structure of American government was inspired by the native Iroquois. But I'm also curious if the Founding Fathers were equally influenced by the Iroquois' own stories about having extraterrestrial origins. What can you tell me about Sky Woman? The Sky Woman is part of the Iroquois Haudenosaunee creation story. There's a world in the sky, and she falls down towards the earth, which is covered with water, and then a giant turtle rises up to catch her. And that land is what Haudenosaunee people call Turtle Island, which is North America. If you look at a map of North America, North America looks like a turtle. Mexico down to Panama is the tail. Florida is one back leg. Baja, California is the other back leg. The front leg is Alaska, and the other front leg is up near Labrador. And the turtle is kind of like that. And it's interesting that 
you would have a creation story and a recognition that North America looked like that uh, without satellites in those days. You just took the words out of my mouth. It's fascinating to hear that a turtle figures into this Iroquois creation story because in ancient cultures all over the world, you can find origin stories that begin with a cosmic turtle. Now, in the case of the Iroquois, it is said that a giant turtle rose up to catch the Sky Woman. But could this really be a reference to some kind of spacecraft? But even if the turtle in the story is only referring to the shape of North America, that's just as incredible. Because how would ancient Native Americans have had any idea about the shape of the continent unless they could see it from space. When the American Revolution started, one of the symbols of the colonist was a Native American woman. It isn't until the 1840s or 50s that you get Uncle Sam. Now, this is fascinating to me that one of the earliest symbols of colonial America was a Native American woman who may have been a representation of the Iroquois Sky Woman. Because we also have that weird story of George Washington being visited at Valley Forge by an angelic female being. In one of the various versions of the story, the Sky Woman goes on to spread soil and seed while standing on the back of a turtle. The turtle then grows and grows and becomes rich and fertile. So is the story of the Sky Woman simply a colorful myth? Or could it be a description of a real flesh and blood extraterrestrial? My investigation must continue. I'm fascinated to learn about the strong connections between men like Benjamin Franklin and the native Iroquois, especially as it relates to the incorporation of Iroquois philosophies and laws into the U.S. Constitution. But I'm also equally excited to find out that the Iroquois have an origin story concerning a so-called Sky Woman who they believe came to Earth tens of thousands of years ago, and that she served as a symbol for the United States until the mid-19th century. To learn more, I've arranged to meet with Native American folklorist Dr. Joanne Shenandoah, a member of the Oneida Iroquois Confederacy. Joanne, what can you tell me how the Iroquois had influence on the Founding Fathers? Iroquois people had a beautiful thing to offer America, and that was democracy, equality, women's rights, and the respect for human dignity, religious rights. There were no class systems. We didn't have kings and queens. What can you tell me about the legend of Sky Woman? First of all, we don't consider it a legend. We consider it reality. We believe this is the beginning of who we are as a people on this earth. When Joanne told me that for her people, these stories of beings descending from the stars are not legend, but reality, it gave me goosebumps because that is the whole point of the ancient astronaut theory. But would it be safe to say that the Iroquois greatly influenced the Declaration of Independence and perhaps even the Constitution? Most definitely. Mm -hmm. They say um, my ancestors seven generations ago Chief Shenandoah was there on the second floor when that was being signed. That's so, I mean, awesome. that's pretty, pretty amazing right there. There's a room full of Iroquois people there mm -hmm. uh, to witness this event, this great event of how people could live in freedom and democracy. So, do you think that the Iroquois creation story had influence on the Founding Fathers? Yes. And I'm not so sure that America is aware even of the fact that the Iroquois um, brought together the colonists and, and showed them a different way. I truly appreciate your time. And they Thank are. you very Thank much. You. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. If someone were to challenge and ask me if it is at all possible that the United States 
perhaps has some ancient astronaut origins or at least some connections, then I'd tell them to look no further than right here in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Because not only can you find entire monuments and buildings inspired by ancient civilizations, civilizations which believe that mankind's ancestors have traveled here from other worlds, but also because, as bizarre as this may sound, there is a statue that could be interpreted as an extraterrestrial right here out in the open for everyone to see. Where is this, you might ask? There, on top of the Capitol Dome, is a statue called the Spirit of Freedom, but it might just as well be called the Sky Woman. It was sculpted by Thomas Crawford and dates back to the 1860s. When you look closely, you can see that she is dressed in what appears to be the native garb of the Iroquois. And on her head is an elaborate headdress made of eagle feathers, which is ringed with stars. Perhaps we shouldn't only be thinking of America as having founding fathers, but also a founding mother. Is it possible that the Iroquois stories about a sky woman were really an attempt by early humans to describe the visitation of a female astronaut in the remote past? And could this mean that it was really an extraterrestrial who inspired the Iroquois to believe that a good government should guarantee its citizens life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Although I'm not entirely convinced, I am open to the idea that the statue on top of the dome could be a depiction of a real flesh and blood extraterrestrial whose influence can still be found by those who study our nation's laws, examine our most sacred of institutions, and everyone who challenges authority in search of aliens.